Good afternoon and welcome to um, uh, E-Rate, what's new for 2018? I am Krista Porter, I am um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, I am the Library Development Director is my title here at the Library Commission, um, just recently um, became that earlier this year. I am also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries um, and that is one of my um, many duties as uh, Library Development Director. And that is the um, capacity that I am uh, presenting to you this morning. I'm just double checking my settings here. Okay. Um, I handle training and consulting and uh, hand holding and um, anything you all need for doing your e rate. Um, that is my job here. We do also have someone on. In Nebraska who handles the same kind of uh, consulting and training and assistance for schools. Um, I do know, I think we do have some people, I'm just checking my registration list, we did have some people that signed up from school, from some schools, but it looks like they haven't logged in yet. But if they do come in later, just let, um, for them to know, um, there's specific the department, the Nebraska Department of Education handles come um, training and consulting for uh, schools in uh, Nebraska. In other states, it's handled um, sometimes by the same people. But the basic setup is the same. Basically, how it works is the same for both. So this workshop will work for schools as well for anyone who does watch it live or um, during our recording. So, uh, get right into our presentation then. It looks like everyone is set and ready to go. All right, so what we're going to do here um, for this presentation is going to be um, a basic E rate introduction. What is E rate? What it's all about? Why would you use it? Um, and then some specific details of some forms that you use. This will hopefully be good for both beginners, someone who, people who are brand new to the E-Rate program, so you have no idea what's going on with it, why you should be doing it, uh, what is it all about. Uh, this I'm hopefully that well, this will help with that, and also for um, our veterans of the program, so that uh, they can just be reminded of things. It always helps to have a reminder of certain things that are happening or how to do certain forms. And there are always tweaks every year to the program, of course, as we. Uh, enjoy as we know uh, so there may be some changes that you will notice so what is e-rate e-rate is a federal program that was uh, created about out of the telecommunication telecommunications act of 1996 um, in that act the FCC dictated to um, that uh, said that schools and libraries and also some other areas healthcare facilities needed uh, affordable telecommunications and internet access telecommunications being telephone and anything related to receiving internet. The, as I said, it was from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, so the first year that you could apply was in 1997, and the first year anyone received funding, received these discounts, was in 1998. So it's a program that's been around for a while, not forever, so we do have some people who have been doing it for uh, a long time, 15 some odd years, and some that are just getting started with it. The monies for this program comes from, comes from the universal service fee. This is one of the many fees, taxes that um, are on your phone bill, your internet bill. Uh, your service providers also pay this fee. You may see them um, listed as USF fee, uh, universal service. Uh, sometimes I've even seen it very rarely listed actually as E-rate um, fee. Um, but everyone, so everybody pays into a pot of money that is then used to give discounts to schools and libraries. The um, FCC, as I said, runs this program. They are um, the one that oversees the program. They create the rules. They decide what you need to do, all of that. They uh, create, send out, they um, created this company, USAC, back just to, in the beginning, to administer the E-rate. So um, this is a non-for-profit company that actually runs all the day-to-day -day operations of the E-rate program. Um, as I said, there's actually some other programs as well that USAC runs. There is one for healthcare facilities, so that health hospitals and healthcare providers can have discounts. One for high cost, so people who are living in areas where internet is really expensive. And for low income, uh, Lifeline, the Lifeline program. So there's other, um, programs that USAC also runs. We and the schools, uh, K through 12 schools and public libraries are under the schools and libraries division of USAC and that runs the E-rate program. E was the acronym put together for it meaning education related. Uh, generally though when I talk about this I talk about USAC as doing things. USAC 
does this, you're going to reply to USAC, because that's where all of the um, information that will come, uh, any contacts from them, emails, whatever, will come from USAC. So the FCC sets the rules. Um, there's and they send out uh, pr produce orders, as they are called, reports and orders with any changes, any updates, and things they want done to the program as a whole. Now um, there haven't been very many of these done over the years. Actually, uh, we're only at the sixth report order was the last one before this modernization. So in the entire life of the program, they've only made major changes a few times. Um, this one, the modernization report and order that came out in 2014, made huge changes. This is where a lot of our changes are coming now that things that we're dealing with. Um, anything in this presentation that is in green, I attempted to make it in green, anything that was as a result of those orders, everything else is the usual things of how um, E-rate is done um, and hopefully things you'll recognize. Um, so there was a couple of different reports and orders that came out that made um, changes. The idea the general overreaching idea was to modernize and streamline the program, try and make it easier for libraries and schools to apply, um, make the forms easier to use, put it all online so everything is available online to everybody. Um, so there's quite a few things that were mixed up in that. Um, so uh, the FCC puts out these orders, USAC then figures out the procedures of how they can make these things happen um, in actual, you know, reality and then submits them back to the FCC for approvals. So there's a little back and forth between them before everything is finalized and then you get the um, result of that and what you're supposed to do. So who can apply for E-rate? Um, all public libraries in Nebraska are el eligible, libraries and library systems. So if we have libraries with branches, uh, the only the, the main criteria that USAC uh, puts on that is that libraries must be eligible to receive LSTA funds, Library Service Technology Act funding. In Nebraska, all public libraries are eligible for that as a uh, trickle down from the Library Commission receiving LSTA funding to provide services to all of you. You use those services, so you're eligible to receive receive services funded by that. Uh, schools and school districts also eligible and if we did have consortia, uh, groups of uh, uh, entities, if a bunch of libraries got together to get a discount on internet access or schools got a discount on some sort of con um, connections or uh, equipment, you'd be able to get a discount as well for those consortia. E-rate is uh, funded, E-rate commitments are done on the, what they call a funding year. So, which always runs from July 1st of a year through June 30th of the next year. So whenever you are thinking about E-rate, you're always thinking to the future. Right now, the E-rate uh, forms are available to start applying for the next funding year, which is funding year 2018, so that's what we're talking about today. So you're thinking, in July of 2018, I have something I want to get a discount on. I have something I'm going to be paying for, something I'm going to be purchasing, and that's what I'm thinking about when I'm starting my process right now in the fall of 2018 winter of 2017. Um, and every year the funding year just goes that way July through June, July through June. There is $3.99 billion available for um, E-rate funding. I don't know why they don't just round that to four, but um, I look it up every year, every time, and that's what it is. It's officially $3.99 billion. Um, it is adjusted for inflation if they need to, if they need more money to uh, fulfill all of the applications that come in, they can roll over some unused funds. They do have um, funds set aside similar to a savings account that you would have. So there is funding from previous years that can be used um, if they go over the need, um, if the need goes over that $3.99 billion. Now, the first thing I always tell libraries when you're looking into doing E-rate or seeing about doing it again is to figure out how much of a discount you can get. How, how do you calculate that? Um, any, libraries can get anywhere from 20% to 90% off of their costs. Um, there's nobody can get zero and there isn't 100% discount. Nobody can get 100% off. 90% is the highest. And there's a couple of different things you take into consideration to calculate your discount. Um, you can calculate this yourself um, offline, as we would say, to figure out what you could be getting. But within the E-rate system itself, when you go online to submit your forms, it will do the calculation for you and tell you what it is as well. So you don't have to do the math within the system. The discount is based on the school lunch the National School Lunch Program. This is the free and reduced lunches that the children receive in school districts. Um, the FCC needed something to determine where, who, who should get the most money, where is the neediest area potentially in, in the country. 
that. And they, there are many ways to determine po various poverty levels. They decided to pick this, assuming if there are more children that are eligible for the school lunch program, the free and reduced lunches, then that is a needier area and will give them a higher level discount. Something key to notice about this is that it says number of students eligible, not the number of students who actually apply, because that number could be different. Uh, the, the government figures out who, which, which families based on their income are eligible for this, um, and then it's up to them to decide to apply. Some don't need to, they have other income, in, uh, other ways to pay for the lunches for their children, or they don't want to apply for, due to the stigma, there's various reasons why they might not. Um, but this is just what we're looking for is the number that are eligible for it, so it would potentially be a bigger number. Um, also, something else to notice is you cannot include um, pre-K kids, so it's only kindergarten through um, senior 12th that you can count up. Um, after you know that number, then you uh, combine that with whether your library is considered urban or rural um, based on U.S. Census data. Oh, actually, going back to the school lunch numbers. The key, also another key to that, as you can see what it says here is the school district in which the library is located. And this means where the school district, where the library is physically located. You may be near a couple of different school districts or two different ones and you serve kids that are from both school districts and that's great, but to do your calculation for E-rate, you look at geographically, physically in what school district does the library physically sit. And that's the school district's numbers that you look at for doing this calculation. So, where do we get this information? Easy for us, on the Nebraska Department of Education website, they actually post all the numbers. They put up a spreadsheet, and I've given you the URL here. Um, you have a, you have a, you should already have a copy of this presentation. If not, you'll be, you can see it later on our website. I also have links to all of this on our E-Rate website. The Nebraska Department of Education posts every year um, the numbers for the school lunch. They post um, a spreadsheet that shows how many children are enrolled, how many are eligible for the reduced, free and reduced lunches, and then what that percentage is, which is the number you need for E-rate purposes. This is a great thing, makes it so much so easy for schools and libraries to look up and find these numbers. Um, in the past, I've heard uh, the horror stories that it wasn't always this wasn't always this way. Some of these schools districts did not have the, the numbers posted, they didn't have them posted at all, and you'd have to call them, call the superintendent, call the school district, call the schools, and find out what their numbers were, which was sometimes confusing. Uh, sometimes these schools did not know that they were supposed to get they, what the numbers were. You didn't get the right person. They didn't want to give out the numbers uh, due to privacy issues. Um, none of that is actually an issue. This is we are not getting actual numbers about who is receiving these lunch program, these free and reduced lunches. So there's no privacy issue for any children being outed as being part of the program. There's no specifics even on the, that e rate needs of who is getting it. And on the spreadsheet, there isn't either. It's just a total number, total number of children that are eligible. So it's much easier. So you go to that website, find your district. There's a a spreadsheet that has each school individually, but it also has a districts tab, a districts sheet within the spreadsheet. You want to go to that, find your school district, and find the percentage. And then you can look up your uh, urban or rural status. This is based still on the 2010 census data. They haven't updated it, so that's what they're using. Most areas in Nebraska are rural, which is good because that does give us a slightly higher discount in some um, areas some areas. Um, and then you use USAC's discount matrix, which is, there we go, this, um, where it shows you where you can take those numbers and figure out how much of a discount you can get. So you can see here, any even for schools that have up to 49%, um, um, haven't even crossed that 50% of the students eligible can still get 60 to 70% off on um, via E-rate. Um, and you can see here urban and rural and some and some levels um, urban or rural gets a slightly higher discount. You also see the top here listed category one and category two. Those are, and we'll get into that in a second, those are the different types of things you can get an E-rate discount on. They're broken up into two different categories and you can see for some of them the discount is the same but then as you get higher up it does uh, get uh, have a little difference. So, so this is how you calculate what um, you could possibly get a discount on. Here in Nebraska, most of our libraries fall in the 60, 70 to 80 percent rate range. Uh, we have a few that are down less, down to you know 40 or 20, and I think we've maybe had one or two at a time at times that have reached up into that 90 percent level. But generally, we're between 60 and 80 percent here in Nebraska. So, 
that's a really good discount. That's a really good uh, discount to get on your internet service, your routers, anything you're buying for the library related to the internet. So uh, definitely something to you know make sure you keep applying for. Any questions yet about E-Rate or calculating your discount or what it's all about? You can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. All right. So, what is eligible? What can you get an E-Rate discount on? What is E-Rateable? Um, every year, the FCC publishes what they call their Eligible Services List. This is a list of everything that, for that current year, is eligible to be applied for for E-Rate. They post it on their website, and this long, annoying URL there that you'll be able to just click on later is where you can go to look at it. Um, they publish a new list every year because they do evaluate what's going on in the world. What is coming up as a new way of getting internet? What is some new piece of equipment libraries need to use to get their a rate or get their internet working. Um, so they're always tweaking it. They do pay attention. They listen to schools or libraries or the public telling them about different things that they think should be included on the list or things that might need to be removed or modified. So when you are looking to apply for E-Rate, you want to make sure you're looking at the correct eligible services list for the year you are applying for. Um, on this uh, website where they uh, that I have here, they list all of the lists from all the years back going back to the very beginning. So if you're curious about what was eligible in 1997, you know, take a look at it. <laughs> um, but make sure you look at the one right now that says it is the list for 2018. It'll be at the top of the page. Often, many times you are working on multiple E-rate funding years at the same time. Right now, some libraries are still finishing up their 2017 E-rate while they're applying for the 2018. So you may need to refer to a previous list uh, depending on your situation and what's going on. So make sure that you just make sure you are look, make sure that you're looking at the right one when you do code to the page. Now this is something that did have a major change to it as a result of this modernization order that came out in 2014 in that they have um, reduced the list, the size of the list. Previously, as you see here, um, starting uh, uh, for 2014, the list was almost 50 pages long. It was this huge packet of information and it was just unwieldy. You could not really find anything in it. Uh, the only way I was able to even search to find anything was to go on to the online version and uh, just you know, do a search in the document to see where is the thing that I might be looking for and what's eligible and what part of it is. They said you need to streamline that. It's too too crazy. People just can't even work with this giant document anymore. So now they've gotten it down to eight pages, about eight, maybe nine pages, depending on how you print it out. Basically, they said let, what they what had happened over the years is, as people were asking, you know, about things they could get, you know, what about this? Can I get this discount on? But what about that version of it? And back and forth and back and forth. And they kept adding all of these things every time every year when somebody asked. So it became very in depth. And they started adding to the eligible service list, services list things that were ineligible, things that you could not get any rate discount on. So half the list was actually here's what you can, and half of it is here what you cannot, um, which was just getting ridiculous to try and work through all of that. And then also tacked on to the end was this huge glossary of all the different terms, terminology you might use. So they said, make it simpler. People want to go to the, they want to know when they go to that list, what can I get a discount on? Everything else can be elsewhere. And now that's what it is. When you go to that list, you'll see a little bit of an introduction of, you know, why some things are on there, some recent changes. But then basically it is just, here's everything that's eligible. And it just boils it down to those eight to nine pages. And basically the idea is, if it's not on this list, it's not eligible, and you know, you won't be even be able to apply for it. What's actually good about the new system as well, where you have do all these forms online, is that anything that is from that list is automatically just available in the online form, and you just choose from a list. Boom, 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 what is eligible, click the ones you want, and add them to your application. Um, so that makes it a lot easier as well. The services themselves, as we had seen in the previous uh, slide about discount, are divided into what they call Category 1 and Category 2 services. Um, these used to be called, for anyone from who's done this historic previously, 
priority one and priority two. Still basically the same breakdown between them as before, but they just renamed them as categories. Category one is getting the services to your library building. So this is your monthly internet bill, your monthly telephone bill, anything related to getting that connection to the building. Category two is once you have that connection set up, how do you get it to all the specific devices within your library building? So the cabling and the router and the wireless access point and the network server, anything you need to get that internet connection to all the different computers or laptops or tablets or whatever that will be using it in the building. So you can kind of think of the difference between category one and two as the wall of the building, of your library building. Category one is up to the wall, category two is inside the walls. And they do have more details about this in the uh, eligible services list itself that we will get into the details of in a second here. Now, one big thing that is changing that many of you may have heard about or be um, or may be uh, dealing with is reducing, um, gradually reducing support for voice services. This is your telephone um, service that is gradually being phased out of the program. Now, the FCC had decided in the modernization report a report and order that they put out in 2014 that they realized, as many of us already know, there is a huge Wi-Fi gap, broadband, internet gap. Many, many areas in the country do not have fast enough, strong enough, good enough internet service. And they wanted to help these areas get that service. They decided they wanted to focus on providing broadband, fast, strong internet service to everywhere that they can. In order to do that, they decided they needed more money from the program because they were not able to provide services to everyone previously. And a way to get have more money available, they figured, was to phase out the voice services. They, they not saying that it's not important, but saying that they wanted to refocus the um, what E-rate is for and have it be for internet-related things, not telephone and voice-related things. Um, it is working. Uh, so far, they have had enough money to fund all their applications from when they started doing this in 2015. So um, that's great that it's working. It is still causing a hardship to many libraries. This is something that school districts, large school districts, large library systems did uh, protest against. Whenever a, the FCC puts out a report or order, you can make comments to it. And uh, many large organizations, and even smaller ones, said that this is wrong. We, we need our telephone support. Telephone is an essential service at our library or school. And if we can't get this, keep getting our 70, 80, 60 percent discount, we're going to have to cut budget somewhere else. Um, the FCC listened to those comments, but did decide to do this anyways. Uh, we don't know if things will be switched come if it will come back I wouldn't uh, hold my breath on that but this is the situation we are in now um, previously I'm gonna go back to the previous slide the way e-rate was uh, distributed out is uh, USAC would look at category one services first and uh, approve all of those that they could and then they would look at category two with whatever money was left over uh, you may remember if you've done any rate in the past that there's always the announcements that priority two is what it used to be called is going to be con is going to be funded only at the 85 percent level or the 90 percent level meaning only the schools and libraries who had that high of a discount calculation would even get their category two funding anyone less was just out of luck because there wasn't enough money and that was how it worked because there's so many requests for the telephone service so now that they are not doing that and they're gradually phasing out the monies that go towards phone, they are able to actually, for all the applications that were submitted correctly and approved, everyone got their money. So it's working. It is a little hard to deal with, but it's just something we have to figure out and um, work with for now until they maybe change it back or not. As I said, I don't think so. Um, what is currently eligible for Category 1? Uh, anything that can get high-speed broadband internet to your building, to your library. So whether it's cable, and this isn't even a, a complete list, just the, some of the more common ones. So cable, modem, DSL, fiber, um, wireless internet, satellite services, anything that you can get to, to get that internet connection to your building, you can get an e, e, your E-rate discount on. Now specifically related to fiber, 
a uh, little explanation here about what that means, definitions coming from USAC. Lit fiber is something that is already there, um, fiber-based service. Uh, you get that from your service provider just like you get any other kind of internet connection and you pay a fee, monthly fee, to get that. Dark fiber, this is something that is it's the same fiber lines that were laid that were there for the lit, but they haven't been turned on yet. When these uh, companies put in the fiber connections, whether through your city or to your building, they put in more than they needed at the time they were doing the construction. Um, they got to, you know, if you remember, if and this happening in your town, digging big trenches, laying in the fiber and the and the cables and everything, and then having to rebury it all. They didn't want to go in and regularly add more and more, so they right off the bat put in more than they needed at the time. Only turned on some of these lines, some of these fiber connections, and left the other ones off. The ones that are still off are called dark fiber. So they are there waiting to be used. What you can do is you can find a company, contact a service provider in your area and see if they own these fiber connections and contract with them to turn them on and connect them to your library building and then that, bec that becomes lit fiber that you then use. Um, the costs for getting that turned on, you can get a discount on. You can get an E-rate discount on because um, there may be some fees for them to turn it on. And of course, if there's extra construction needed to bring it to your building. Um, if you are applying for the dark fiber, they, and you can see here there is um, instructions from E-rate says to choose when you're asking for it in your first form of the process, both dark and lit. Um, even if you know that, well, it's just dark fiber that I'm looking for, that's what I want to find, what's going on, that's okay, but keep your options open just in case there's already lit fiber that's out there that you just weren't available, weren't aware of. So when you um, are considering reaching out and seeing if there's any dark fiber, you'll just make sure you choose this choice that is a combination of both, and you'll see that when you get onto the form. Um, another way that you can get your fiber um, option is a self-provision network. This is where you as the customer, you as the library actually owns it all yourself. You don't contract with a separate company. Um, you hire someone to get it connected to you, but then you own and run that network yourself. I don't know of many libraries in Nebraska that may you know, go this route and do this, actually running your own internet network, but just so you know, this is something you will see coming up on your forms, and that's what that's um, referring to. As I mentioned, special construction, anything related to installing the fiber, dark lit, self-provisioned, whatever, to your library is also eligible for E-rate discount. So if you do need to do these one-time costs, it's not just your monthly bill that you can get an E-rate discount on, but your one-time construction costs of um, pro getting the connection actually put to your library, any project management fees, any costs related with um, you know, preparing for it, all of that can be done um, as a category one request as well. Now related to the special construction, USAC does know and realize that construction companies don't always necessarily work on the E-rate funding year as uh, July 1st to June 30th of a particular funding year. They know that that you know, just because you know, of schedules and coordination it just might fall not fall into that time frame and they take that in consideration and said and they say that anything that you do need to do can be done up to six months prior to the start of an actual funding year that you're applying for so anything after January 1st so um, for example if you are going to be looking for dark fiber or lit fiber and you need construction done and you're applying for the 2018 funding year that officially starts in July you can work with your provider to have that construction done at any time during 2018 really um, you just have to make sure that you do follow through and get that service um, with them when July 1st does come along so uh, the voice service phase down they gradually decided to reduce support for telephone starting with 2015 um, by taking 20 percent off of each of the discount each year so you'd gradually have 20 percent off more and more each year as you can see in this chart so the first year um, everybody still is getting almost everybody except for the very lowest level we're still getting a discount um, just 20 percent less than your main discount for your internet and then each year went down another 20 20 20 uh, this year, the only the libraries that would get a discount at all for telephone would be anyone at the 90% level as far as your basic calculation and you get 10% off still on your phone and then next year everybody's out, it's done. There's no longer any more voice services. 
And this is anything that carries a voice service, any sort of connection. So your local long distance 800 service, uh, plain old telephone service, that's what POTS is an acronym for, um, satellite phone, wireless cell phone service, anything that's related to the um, voice. Um, and this is what E-rate is really about, is what is the service you are getting? That's what they are talking about when, they're, when you're getting um, service from, getting a discount through E-rate. So for cell service, it would be the voice connection, but if you have data, that would not that would be okay because that's internet related. So there is that difference there. Um, so if you have and so if you have multiple lines that are carrying things, you got to make sure that it is the uh, the the circuit that's carrying the voice is what is having the phase down. Anything that's internet still gets your full discount, no problem there. So that is our category one services. Any questions? Questions about category one, uh, what is eligible, what isn't? Anything that I've already mentioned today, go ahead and type into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can see that here on my computer and answer your questions. Let me get a little drink. No? All right. So we're going to go on now to Category 2. Now Category 2 services work a little differently than Category 1 as, as far as how you calculate your discount. Um, category 2, as I mentioned, is anything to bring your broadband um, in your building, anything to connect all of your computers to your network, um, to your internet, all of that. Uh, the way they they give you money in category two is something they call five-year budgets. They create a budget for how much money you can spend over a five-year period and then you can deduct from that as you're going through the five years and I'll explain more detail about that in just a couple of slides. So it works slightly differently than just getting a discount on your bills the way it does for category one. Um, this includes things um, internal connections which is all your physical equipment, um, a new way of getting internet managed internal broadband services, and a basic maintenance, the ongoing maintenance, repair, uh, upkeep of your internal connections. So specifically, internal connections include all of these things, basically all the physical equipment that you might need to um, get your internet throughout your library. So um, wireless access points, cables, firewalls, networks, uh, switches, routers, racks, um, uninterruptible power supplies, um, and any improvements or upgrades necessary to keep these things working. Um, and software related to that. Now generally speaking, we use potentially have looked into this about well, E-rate, things like software like Microsoft Word and Excel and databases that you subscribe to online are not eligible. But software that's related to making your intranet work, to making your network work, that is what is eligible. So um, if you do have to pay for any of that or do any upgrades related to that, that is something that you would be able to get a discount on because it's related to getting your intranet service. Uh, something else, some new way of getting, um, having an internet connection, managed internal broadband services is what E-Rate calls it. Um, I honestly, I didn't know what that meant when I first read it, so I did some searching online and found out managed Wi-Fi is also what it's called. Um, but basically, this is having a third party completely run everything related to your library's internet connection, and you have nothing to do with it. No monitoring, um, no um, keeping up the equipment or anything. All of that is just handled totally by this separate company. Um, you just contract with them and let it go, and they handle it for you all all on their own, any problems, any issues, they handle that for you. So if this is something that you hear about in your area, some new company company coming in with this kind of service, look into it and see what it costs and you might be able to switch over to it and um, get a discount. The other thing under category two is the basic maintenance of these internal connections. Any repair, upkeep, a replacement um, that you need of any of this, uh, any of these this equipment that you've purchased. So if you need to replace a router because it died, if a squirrel gets into your walls and chews through your cabling and you need to have that rerun, replaced, all of those kind of things, you can get a discount on as well. So this is just the ongoing upkeep of just keep having this equipment. Now this is something that you have to have already somehow contracted or arranged for in, in some way. So sometimes it might be 
our, our internet service provider as part of their service to us provides us with this kind of repair and support and upgrading. Great, that's included. Um, or you have someone, a separate person in town that you deal with that actually will come in and do this. The local IT company or local IT uh, computer store will come over and do the work. And that's great. You have to have something set up with them ahead of time, something in some contract with them. Um, but then you only get a discount on work that is actually performed. So when they actually have to come and do any of this upkeep or repair for you. So for example, if you're paying a monthly fee of say $20 a month to have them on call, that's not eligible for E-rate, but if they do have to come into your library and then they charge you the hourly fee and the cost for the, um, the, the parts and labor, all of those costs, that is then what you can apply for and get a discount on. Now the last thing that you can get an E-rate on is something that could be um, in either category 1 or category 2, and this is all of your miscellaneous things. Um, all your taxes and fees and surcharges and everything that you pay extra on your bill beyond just the, I pay $50 a month for internet, all of those are eligible for an E-rate discount as well. So uh, make sure when you're applying for E-rate you tell USAC this is how much it's going to cost me. Don't just put down we pay $50 a month for E-rate, put down, we pay $58.72 a month because of all these taxes and fees. And you get a discount on all of that. Um, anything related to um, renting or shipping, anything related to that having to do with your internet services, training. If you need to send, if you are have, do have someone on your staff who is your network person and they monitor all of your internet and they need to go to a training workshop or to learn something, that cost can you can get a discount on as well. Also something new, um, installation and configuration of new certain new products, new, new equipment. Um, previously when you purchased the actual piece of equipment, the router, the wireless access point, the cost of installation had to be part of that deal. So normally you just got it from your service provider as part of having them. Now you can have someone else install the equipment if you want to. Um, they know that there is, you can buy routers and servers online now from Amazon or anywhere, or go out to Best Buy and then bring them to your library and have someone come in and install it. Now that ex, that installation can be, you can get an E-rate discount on that as well because they know this is a way that some libraries are working to get their internet all set up. All right. So that's category two, was available for category two services. Any questions about those? before I jump on to um, calculating your Category 2 budgets and figure out how much money you get for them. All right, well, let's go on to our Category 2 budgets. So budgets is kind of, um, I find it, it's been a confusing term to use. Basically what this is, it's a, I, I describe it as kind of a pretend budget that E-Rate is calculating for you and saying, we think you could spend this much money um, in the next five years on all of these category two type services, this equipment, the construction and everything. And we're going to calculate that for you and then we're going to say you can use it over the next five years, however much you need each year depending on what you might be purchasing. Um, you might have a big project you're doing and you spend it all in the one first year because you're building a new building or something, that's fine. You might have a bits and pieces you want to buy throughout those five years and that's fine as well. Um, this Category 2 budget, you can start at any time starting back as far as 2015 through 2019 as your first year. Um, this is only through 2019 because this is their first time doing this and that's their first five-year period. Uh, they're going to see how it goes. By 2019, there will be... I. I more instruction on how we're going to be going to the future. Um, basically, did this work? Did everybody understand Category 2 budgets? Did it work to get the money to them? Um, and then decide, do we start another five-year uh, cycle? Right now, we don't know, but this is, so we have to just gotta, just gotta keep our eyes open. Um, so they calculate a budget for each library, and I'll tell you how to, that's done in just the next slide. And you can receive discounts on the cost of your Category 2 services up to that budget amount. You don't have to limit what you're purchasing up to that amount. So if they say you get you know, $15,000, you can. it's not that you can only spend fifteen. dollars You can have a project that is bigger than that, that costs more than your what your budget is calculated at, and, as, and that's fine. You'll just only receive a discount on the first bit that is E-rate in your E-rate calculation. <clears throat> so if your project costs $20,000 and, <clears throat> excuse me, 
and your E-rate um, budget is only 15000 you only get a discount on that first 15000 The other extra bit you're on your own for. So um, you're, you're, happy, you're welcome to do whatever you need to, and you'll just apply for what you can, uh, what E-rate will cover. <clears throat> Now, to calculate the budget for a library, right now, this does say for funding year 2017, which is the previous year, not the one we're applying for yet. This is because they haven't announced yet what the number is going to be for the upcoming year. This cost is uh, adjusted each year for inflation, and since we're not, we don't have the form available yet to do this, we don't know what it's going to be. But you can guesstimate you know, at least a little bit based on the current years. Um, when they first started this, it, um, the pre-discount budget is based on the size of your building. How big is your library? How many square feet? And this is for all floors, um, everything within your library walls. And you take $2.35, multiply that dot by the number of square feet, and that gives you your discount budget. They do have a minimum, though, that they want to meet. They don't want to be giving, they have decided that we're not going to just do little bitty amounts to tiny, tiny libraries. We do have a minimum of this wonderful, awkward number, $9,412.80. Um, as I said, this is adjust, has been adjusted each year for inflation. The first year that they did this, it was $2.30. That was 2015. So you can see it's gone up a little bit each year. We can assume it might go up for inflation in 2018 to, you know, 36 cents, 37 cents, potentially. When they first did this, it came out to a nice round number for the minimum, and it, sound, it was great. Um, but now, just doing math, this is the minimum that they want it to be, is the 9,412 and 80 cents. So, in a real life example, your library is 3,500 square feet. You multiply that by $2.35, and you get $8,225. However, there is a minimum that they'll pay to all libraries, so not your actual budget is going to be $9,412.80. If your square feet calculation came up to more than that $9,000, that's just what it would be math-wise. You, know, you just do the math. So you do use your discount rate in, relate, in, in conjunction with this, this, this pre this budget that they've created for you, however. So you figure out what this budget is, how much you're going to have for your five years, and then you apply whatever your discount calculation percentage is. In this example, they just, to make it easy for the math, they used 50% discount rate. So this library is 3,500 square feet. They get the minimum of the 9,412, but they apply, um, you only get, that's your full budget. They're saying, this is how much we think you could, we, you know, think might be good for you to spend, and you now get 50% of that discounted off, so you actually receive $4,706.40 in funds to spend. So they say, here's how much you can spend, 94, 9,400, your discount, we will discount half of that, and you'll get that much money. Um, whatever your library's square foot is, we'll, you know, it'll adjust appropriately for that. So it is a little, it's very different from how you calculate category one. Category one is just, this is my bill and take, we'll use this example, take 50% off of it and that's what I'll pay. For category two, they say, here's a chunk of money, a pretend chunk of money that we think you we might spend, take your discount off and this is how much you'll have to spend. This is calculated also within your E-rate account online and they do track when you spent money and just deduct it off of that amount as you go so you know how much you spent and how much you have left. So you, they will keep track of that for you, which is nice. Um, as I said, you can use this however you want best, um, whatever best suits, um, suits you for what you're doing in your library. So if you're building a new building or a whole new computer lab being upgraded, you might spend your entire budget in your first year, and that's fine. You just won't be able to do any category. You won't be able to get a discount on any category due cert two services for the next four years because that was your five-year block. Um, you can divvy it up evenly between the years and find something to spend or just go, you know, um, use it as you go. Uh, we have one library here in Nebraska that is actually seems to be doing that. Last year they bought um, a whole bunch of routers, like 13 routers, are, and they're just you know, basically stocking up equipment. This year they're buying a bunch of switches, you know, 10 switches that they know they need. So getting, keeping your equipment up to, speed, up to date is a way of doing it as well. So, you know, look at what's available in Category 2 as potential things you can buy and see if you might need to be replacing those at any time in the next four or five years. And you can, you know, Put them, put them in, buy them, and then you get them at a lower um, cost.
These budgets are recalculated each year uh, based on your square footage if it changes. Uh, hopefully it doesn't go down, but if you were expanding, building a new building, moving into a new space, you would then have to redo the calculation based on whatever your new square footage is uh, to, to make it accurate. So that's our Category 2 budgets. Any questions about those? They can be a little confusing, yes, but as you're actually working through them and using them each year, it does get uh, make more sense. All right. So there's a couple of other things that you do need to uh, pay attention to when you are applying for E-rate. Uh, technology planning is one that's actually no longer required. <laughs> it's a little uh, trick, I guess. <laughs> um, it used to be, the reason I mentioned this here is because technology plans did used to be required for E-rate purposes. You had to write a plan, you had to submit it to me, I approved it, and then you were allowed to um, check that off on your um, E-rate forms and say, yes, we are doing um, we have a plan. They no longer require this. It was a big hardship for some of our small libraries that just don't have the time or the people to create a plan every um, few years. Um, but it's still a good idea to have one. I will advocate for that, of course. Um, it keeps you on track with what's happening with your technology, what you might need to be planning for. Um, we've just bought new computers. We've got to make sure in four years we are prepared to buy replacements potentially, um, those kind of things. Also specific to Nebraska, if you are working on being accredited, uh, an accredited library, you can earn points towards your accreditation by having a technology plan. That's one of the boxes you can check off. So um, no longer required, but still a good idea to have one. Also, um, you may still see it mentioned on some forms. There's still some um, holdover where some wording has not been changed yet. So anywhere you do see it, you are you can actually just ignore it now. But I just like to make sure you know that it was out there in case it pops up somewhere and you're confused. The other thing that you do have to pay attention to is SIPA, the Children's Internet Protection Act. In order to apply for and to receive E-rate funding, you do need to be in compliance with SIPA. This is talking about filtering. This is the filters that you have on your computers blocking certain things uh, from the internet. Uh, compliance with SIPA is required for any internet access or internal connections. Um, Previously, because we had telephone, that was did not need to have SIPA compliance because, well, there's no internet coming through your phone. It's just voice service. So there was the, those for that, you didn't need to be compliant, but only for anything internet related. Uh, this being the last year that anyone can even get the littlest bit of telephone uh, discount, I'm kind of switching to saying basically anything you want to do, almost anything you want to apply for for E-rate, you have to be compliant. So this counts for your basic monthly internet charges and all of that equipment that you purchase that has to do with getting your core internet. So everything category two obviously is is related to getting receiving your internet. So all anything in there, you got to be compliance in compliance with SIPA, and anything internet related under category one. SIPA is a um, point of contention in many libraries, in many areas. People have varying opinions on it, all the way from don't talk to me about filtering, it is uh, totally against my values. Libraries are about freedom of access to information and everyone being able to access anything they want to. It's censorship, I don't want to talk about it, up to protect the children from everything, block it all, <laughs> and everything in between. Um, your libraries may have varying opinions on that, either your staff, your boards, your community standards may vary, um, and that's fine. You need to decide for yourself if this is something that you can figure out how to comply with in order to get these discounts and still um, have everybody be happy and accepting of it. Now, to our benefit in the E-rate world, SIPA is a really, really vaguely written act. It doesn't have a lot of specifics to it. It's pretty vague, and that works to, to, our, to our advantage. Um, it does not say, here's a list of all the websites you have to block. It doesn't say block YouTube, block Facebook, block these things. Um, it just says what kinds of things to, that need to be blocked. Um, 
it doesn't say what you have to use to block them. The, the second item here, technology protection measure, that's the filter itself. If there is no list of here's all the acceptable filters you can use. You can use anything that's out there that works for it. Um, so it's, it's pretty open for what you can do. It also does not say at what level things need to be blocked. So it does not say everything must be blocked at the high security level on your internet. On your on your filter whatever it's doing um, it does leave it to local um, choice uh, local uh, values um, and situations in your library you may have children's computer room and you may have adult computer rooms or computers in different areas of the library uh, and you can adjust it for each of those areas what it does say is you have to have a filter of some sort, whether it's physically on each computer, whether it's coming from your service provider, whether it's a software package on your computers, on your routers, whatever, on all of the library's computers in some way. So anything that is your owned computers. If a patron comes in with their own laptop, they don't have to have a filter on it. That's not your responsibility. It's only have anything that your computers do, that filter has to somehow be on there. Once it's on there, then you can decide at what level you put it at. Do you put it all um, at the highest level for the children's computers, potentially? Do you put it at the lowest level or turn it off for your adult computers or, yes, your, even your staff computers? Anything that receives the internet service that you're getting an E-rate discount on or uses the internet equipment that you're getting the E-rate discount on has to have a filter on it. But then that would include if your staff computers, even in the back room, access the internet, but then once you install it or have it on there, you can either turn it off, put it at the lowest level, whatever works best for you. Um, and potentially no one even knows that you ever had a filter installed because it really doesn't block anything. Um, and you still get your rate discount. You have met the, the requirements of SIPA. Sounds a little wonky, I know. Sounds like it shouldn't work that way, yes. However, they wrote this very vaguely at the time. Uh, I'm sure the you know the idea was protect the children, make sure that no nobody is watching anything bad or porn or anything too violent. However, um, when they wrote it, they either knew that it was going to be hard to do or just didn't know how to write it <laughs> strongly. And so we do have ways that if you are concerned about filtering and censorship, you can work around it and get your E-rate discount. This is how I teach SIPA. It isn't necessarily how some people may want me to, um, who are you know really for this. But I am here to teach you how to get your E-rate money, and this is how it works. This is how it's written, um, so that you can do that. So if you're not sure about filtering, if you don't at your library, I recommend investigating it. Um, there's information here on the E-rate website. I also have information on our E-rate website about SIPA. And I can also talk to you about it if you need some more advice on what does work and what doesn't work and, you know, how I can make it happen and so I can get my E-rate discount. Um, or to help you explain it to someone in your community who might not think you should filter um, or think you're doing it improperly, I can help you navigate that. But this is something you do have to think about when you are thinking about when you're doing E-rate now. Any questions about that? I'll... Uh, Open that up just in case anybody wants to ask questions about that. Right now. No, nothing right now. All right, that's cool. <laughs> don't forget, if you have any questions as we're going, you don't have to wait for me to ask. Um, go ahead and type it into your question section. I'll grab it as it, you know it comes up. <clears throat> So, now that we know the basics of E-Rate, what's it all about, um, what, it, what it, you can get E-Rate on, what the discounts are, things you need to be taking into consideration, now let's get to the actual um, applying, the E-Rate forms themselves. There are four forms uh, that, you need, that are related to applying for E-Rate. Everyone submits the first three on this list. No questions asked, except for a few little things. Um, the fourth one will depend, and the extra one there is a one-time only form, so that's why I put it kind of its own separate area. And we're going to get into the details and the specifics of all of these, so this is just a very brief, you know, 
overview of them on this slide here. The Form 470 is what you're su submitting right now. It's available now. You can start, um, you can apply for it right now and say you're looking for someone, you're looking for a service to get a E-rate discount on. 471 is a second form, which is when you've decided on who, what service you're going to get and what provider you're going to get it from. That form is not available yet. It won't be even available to you until most likely sometime in January of 2018, the date to be announced yet. 46 is the third form. This is after you've been approved for your E-rate, you then tell USAC that you want the monies. Um, this is, you do have to say, yes, we would like it. Um, why might you not want E-rate to get the money? There are situations where that does happen, so you do have to confirm with them um, that you do want to receive the money. Uh, the fourth form there, this is the one that depends. Um, you see, I'm getting my discount, we're all good to go, and now give me my money. You can either receive a discount as right from your service provider right off the bat, it's a discounted bill that you receive and you pay that, or you pay your bills in full and get a reimbursement later. And I'll get into more details about that. That's what that extra form here now, the 498, is having to do with your reimbursements, um, which if you may remember, know, recognize the phrase BEAR, that's the BEAR form, Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement, I think. Um, you one time, um, reimbursements are now done via direct deposit. So you will once have to provide E-rate um, USAC with your banking information. And that's what the 498 form is for. That's when, unless you change your bank um, information, bank account info, that's the thing you don't have to do once. The other forms you do every year. It's an ongoing process. Every year you have to reapply for the next year and just keep doing it um, rotating throughout the year. This is a... Uh, Timeline of the forms um, and in what order you do them in. Uh, as I said, right, you start off with the 470, and we're not going to get into this, too many of the details here on this slide because I am going to go into each step uh, through um, the other slides we've got in the presentation. But this is just a way that it shows you at least where um, things go and in what order. We also have this timeline on our website. I strongly recommend going there and seeing it there. We have a general one that just tells you in general what time of year each thing is done and then we will have one specific to each funding year with specific dates um, and there are deadline dates um, that do apply for each year um, and we don't know what those are yet because they have not been announced um, but and I'll get into the specifics of those in a bit uh, so we don't have specific deadlines yet for the forms for this year but you can start the process and I strongly recommend doing it. Don't wait. <laughs> get your 470 out there. Get it done. And then wait for the deadline. So at least you know you've met the deadline. Um, and then we'll know hopefully soon what how everything else falls out. So related to these forms, you must keep copies of everything related to applying for E-rate for 10 years. Um, after the last date of service. This is something that also changed. You can see it's in green. It used to be a five years that you had to keep them. Now it's 10. Now, um, obviously, since it was originally only five years, if you don't have 10 years going back from now, that's okay. It's going to be 10 years from, you know, eventually you'll have 10 years worth of, of uh, paperwork and E-rate forms and everything. It is from the last date of service, which means the end of a funding year, which is that June 30th date is the always the end of your funding year. So for what you're applying for right now, which is for funding year 2018, you will need to keep everything related to that through June 30th of 2029. That's 10 years. Yes, that is a long time, but you do not have to keep piles and piles of papers in binders or in file cabinets. You can keep things electronically if you want to. They don't care. USEC does not care how you keep these documents, just that you are able to get them to them if they ask for something. Um, you can actually see behind me, whoop, on this side, these binders here behind me, that's my old E-rate binders from previous years. Um, that's how it was done in the past. Actually, before we had an online system, all these forms were done in paper done in paper, mailed out, they mailed things back to me as whole well, lots, lots and lots of paperwork flying back and forth. Now it's all online in the online system or you can keep them scanned and online on your computer, on a flash drive, on a hard drive somewhere, wherever you want to. Um, for things that are contracts for recurring services, that have to do with the current funding area, you have to keep those as well. So for example, if you signed a contract originally with your service provider back in 2010 and it applies to this year's E-rate, you still need to keep that contract 
through 2029 because it has to do with this year's E-rate application. So think about those things, anything you have that's related, um, just make copies, put them in the file folder with the ones that are for this year and just keep those kind of things organized. Um, SIPA, if you do do anything with SIPA documentation, proving you know when you purchase the filter, when you had it installed, all of that, of course you'd have to keep forever as well because that's going to apply to every single year that you apply for in the future. And these are the things that we're talking about that you need to keep. Any forms that you submit, any letters that you receive, any correspondence from USAC asking you questions. Now, a lot of these things now may be coming to you electronically. With the new online system that E-Rate has, they will save all of your forms in there. They will contact you within there. You will reply to them within that account. All of that online counts for keeping it. They have said that they will hold everything in there for the 10 years, just like they said that you need to. However, I do recommend keeping your own copies locally. Uh, you never know if their system is down, what will be their version of the system in 10 years, if something will get lost in some sort of translation or in transition, you never know. It doesn't hurt to just get yourself a PDF copy, download something, save it onto your own computer, at least, so at least you have your own version of it. Um, any bids you receive, any companies that contract you, contact you with contracts or agreements, correspondence with them, um, when you're having equipment delivered, invoices, delivery receipts, all of that. Basically anything related to something you got an E-rate discount on, you need to keep for those 10 years. Now. Um, E-Rate has a new E-Rate portal, new as in a few years old, called um, the E-Rate Productivity Center. The acronym is EPC, which is pronounced EPIC. This comes from them. Uh, how EPIC it is, is to be determined. That's my ongoing joke for the last few years. Uh, <laughs> um, we're still deciding. Uh, some parts of it are great. I would call epic and great changes. Some things still need work. And we'll see as we go through here now, as we look at each of these forms, which things are really useful and helpful to us and which things are still a little meh. Um, starting in 2016, with funding year 2016, all forms, almost all forms, are submitted via the EPIC system, the E-Rate Productivity Center. There's still one form that we'll, I'll talk to you about later that is still in the old legacy system, as they call it. It's also online, but it's just not in, in EPIC yet. They just haven't been able to program it to work in there yet. Hopefully next year. Cross our fingers. Uh, easy to get to, portal.usac.org is the website, uh, the URL to get directly to your EPIC account. Now, why did they make this change? Um, this was uh, one of the things that was asked for, from the FCC dictated from that report and order in 2014, get everything online, Make you know, bring us into the 21st century. Um, so many places you can apply for things with online forms and web-based things and have an online account to track everything. There have been versions of online access in the past for E-Rate couple of different iterations of it that had some things. They weren't as all-encompassing as this hopefully final version that we have. There was online places to go for each form, but there was each their own sec their own form, their own uh, place to search for everything. With this, all of your forms, every single form you submit and access to it is in one place. Anytime USAC contacts you for, to ask a question, for clarification, for anything, they will contact, it'll be within the system. Any notices and reminders you'll get will be in here. Um, you reaching out to USAC to ask your questions of them, of their customer service, is all within there. Um, so it is really slick that they have everything in one place now, so you just have to remember one place to go to to do all of your E-rate. Um, something else that is great about it, <coughs> excuse me, is that you can use this from any type of device you want to and from any web browser. Um, previously, if you any of you may remember doing E-Rate in the last few years, in a previous version of submitting forms online, you could only use Internet Explorer to submit your forms. It was the only browser that was guaranteed to work. It was actually the only browser that their government programmers um, programmed you know, behind the scenes to work. Unfortunately, you could use Firefox or Chrome to submit, and it kind of looked like you submitted it, but it didn't actually process through in the end. And we had too many libraries who thought they had submitted something, 
um, assumed it was in and it actually wasn't and there was a lot of back and forth and having to you know uh, extend deadlines for things because people didn't realize they could only use Explorer. Um, yeah, badly designed, badly programmed, definitely. <laughs> Um, now with this new system, they contracted with a company that does this for business, does these online interfaces and online um, uh, services. It's not something that was necessary that was actually originally programmed for E-rate. So there are still some parts of it that look a little like that don't seem to make sense to us. They've kind of tried to shoehorn in E-rate into it, uh, so there it is a little. Um, not in, unintuitive in some areas, but it is definitely better than what we had. Um, it's all relative. <laughs> uh, and you can use any browser you want to, if you like Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer or Safari, whatever. And any device, your, your computer, your laptop, even if you wanted to use your cell phone, that you could. Um, I wouldn't recommend applying for, you know, submitting forms on your cell phone. It's a little small screen there, but you could um, check up on your application. Just look up something, see if a notice has been sent to you. Definitely, you could log into your account from there if you wanted to. Now, to get started with this, USAC creates an account for whoever was doing your E-rate previously based on the contact info on a previous form. Um, this would be, I believe it was either 2016 or, and 17, they would look and see who submitted a form and then automatically create an account for that person. They were sent an email saying, hey, you've been sent up in, with an account in Epic, go ahead and start using it. Um, one person is the account administrator. They are in control of um, whoever, you know, adding new users, uh, keeping everything up to date. Um, oh, actually, it was the account administrator, the original one was whoever did before this, use this system, whoever submitted the 471, the second form of the process in 2015, that person was the one who was set up with an account. So it was a few years ago. Um, once they are set up, they can add users, update information about the account, bring in someone new to do it, whatever it is. Um, they need to do to access it. Uh, you can have organizations for independent schools and libraries, school districts, library systems. Most people, most in Nebraska, we are independent libraries. Each library just has its own individual account. Uh, something that you used to have need to have was a PIN number, that um, randomly generated letters and numbers thing that you could never remember what it was. I always actually in one of those binders behind me there it is, <laughs> is my little piece of paper with my PIN. Um, you do still need that for one more form, that one that's less still out there in the legacy system. But for the Epic system, you no longer need a number that is generated by um, E-rate. You create your own password and you make that up yourself. Um, so much easier, mostly, for libraries to use. Uh, then, um, as an account administrator, the main person, you can then create as many other users as you want, and there are various um, levels that you can have people have access to. Um, a full user, so they can do everything in the system, complete forms, file them, certify them, whatever. Um, partial can do some work on the forms, but not actually submit them. And then view only, where people can just go in and look at things. Most of this kind of breakdown is for larger organizations, so you may be at a larger library that has different people that have different um, author authority to do things. So maybe you have a tech person or someone at your library who knows your internet that you need that submit, creates the form and knows what services you need or what equipment, but then you want your library director to be the one that actually signs off on actually submitting it. In that case, you may give people different um, levels. Most of our libraries in Nebraska, though, if you're just a single person, you're the one that does it all, full user is pretty much what you'd be doing all the time. So um, you can get to it from that URL I mentioned to you, but also this is the USAC website, the main page for schools and libraries specifically, usac.org slash SL for schools and libraries. And you have a couple of different places that you can get into. In the upper right, there's a blue button, EPC button over there. And then at the left and the under in the menu is apply for E-rate as a link. When you click apply for E-rate, you actually get a second page which talks a little bit about um, the EPIC system and the E-rate program, but this is also where you would go if you need a new account created for you. If you don't already have an EPIC account, um, if a previous person who did do it has left the library and didn't pass on to you their login info, 
you would need to contact them underneath the epic button there to the right it says new users contact us that is where you can reach out to E-Rate USAC to give you a new account now it'll depend on if you need to do that as a new person if you many some of our libraries you have a generic email address to log to, that you use or the director has a generic email address you know like library director at so and so public library org if that's the same email address that has been used before your login username for epic is that email address you can just use that reset your password and get yourself set up working it however if you have been issued a new email address specific to you potentially like with your name like mine is krista.porter at nebraska.gov I would have to contact if, if my previous account administrator a previous person at my library hadn't already set me up with an account I would have to use this link to contact USAC to get me a new account you just let them know I'm a new director I need access to my account they may ask you for some proof or something and then you get set up for it but when you go to log in you click and you're ready and you've got your login info use that epic a sh link button there's a short little here's the terms I agree and then you type in your username um, and your password now you can see here my username in this screenshot is krista.burns at nebraska.gov um, as some of you know I got married last year so my name has changed but my username for this is still the same um, if you do or if you are using the same email address as I mentioned this is where you've got that forgot your password link this is where if you're using the same email address as the previous person but you don't know what their password was that's perfectly fine Check, click that forgot your password link it will ask you for your username which is your email address and then it will send you an you know, one of those if you've ever done this before the usual here's the link to click on to reset your password and then you can make up your own password now there are some rules to this password as with many places that are doing online things now um, the things that they think make our passwords more secure you do have to have an uppercase letter uppercase lowercase um, a number and a special character yeah special character meaning like an asterisk an exclamation mark those kind of things also you have to change this password every 60 days this is not something that USAC asked for. This is not something that we like. We did complain about this when this company that we set up with said that was one of the rules, how it worked. And we said, we need to eliminate that. That's a hardship. That's ridiculous. How, I mean, sometimes libraries are doing, aren't doing forms even every 60 days. There's lag between each form you have to do. And they're gonna, not gonna remember that they need to change the password. They, well, they just wouldn't, as they said, that's something built into it. We just can't do anything about that. So that's one of the things we just have to go with. <laughs> um, however, what's interesting is they only keep, and I can't remember if it's either four or five of the most recent of your passwords saved in their system and knowing that you've already used it and can't reuse it. Also, you only don't have to change very much to, to have a new password in this system. Uh, what, we, what I recommend is make up some sort of a standard format. So like PubLib exclamation mark, E rate, the E capitalized one, the number one. It's great. When it says that you need to read to change your password, just change that one to a two. PubLib, PubLib exclamation mark, E rate two. The next time, three, then four. Uh, the whole rest of that password can stay the same. All you have to do is change one thing, just that one number. And once you've rotated through one, two, three, four, one through nine, you can go back to one again. By then, they've forgotten all your previous ones. I strongly recommend doing that way don't drive yourself crazy I've had many libraries who every time I if I need to help them and I ask for their password to look into their account they've made up a whole new thing you know like puppy 17 exclamation mark Wow and then the next time it's cows are yummy <laughs> um, question mark 72 you know whatever you don't have to get that crazy each time and making up a whole new password with all different things just set up a format and just change that number every time easy when you are due to renew to change your password it will prompt you once you've tried to log in with your current one it'll pop up with a thing saying your passwords already expired or it's due to expire and let you um, change it so that's one of the things that with this new system is not the best but we work with it so 
Once you do have figured out whatever your past login is going to be, we sign in to our Epic account. And um, there we go. here is our landing page. This is where you start off with whenever the first time you log in, you'll be at your landing page. This is your home page for your um, whole Epic account. Anywhere you are in the in your account here, if you ever see this logo, the Universal Service Administrative Company logo with all those blue boxes, you can click on that and it'll always bring you back to this landing page where you started. Um, on my screenshots here, this is just the top half of the page. Um, we have, um, you can look, and we're going to go through all the specifics of all these different sections. Across the top, there's a blue bar with some menu items. In the upper right, you can see there's links to starting all different forms you want to do and working with your users and organizations. Then in the middle, we have, you can look up different notifications. Have any of your forms been submitted? Um, information about your entity, that's you as a library. Um, below that is my tasks, which I've done a second screenshot of the next session. These are forms and things you are in the middle of working on that you haven't completed and submitted yet. And then at the bottom is, oh, you can customer service cases if you've asked any questions or if they've asked you anything, this is where they would be listed. And then looking up your actual forms themselves, um, what have you submitted, what their status is. Now we're going to go through every part of this so you can see what they are all um, about. So at the top, we have our blue bar, and there's five different menu items across the top here. News, tasks, records, reports, and actions. First item is news. Now when you click on the blue bar up here for news, you get um, some useful things, and as some of you may have um, discovered, some not no so useful things. Um, and this screenshot is actually kind of good. Um, these are SL and news briefs, schools and libraries news briefs that have come up in my screenshot. Every week, USAC sends out a weekly newsletter, so to speak, on, um, through email and into your Epic account with just what's going on recently, um, here's some upcoming deadlines, here's a quickie how to you know, evaluate an uh, application, you know, how to submit a form, um, articles written in there. However, also mixed in here could will be anything that has been sub, um, about other libraries. Um, what if a library has submitted a form, if a library has received a notification about something, if somebody's updated their info. E-rate information is all public. It's all publicly posted out there so anybody can know about it. And it all dumps into here in this one general news thing, news category. So it's not very user friendly at all. So even though it's right up there in the top bar, um, we do not recommend using that. And I just learned this honestly last month at an E-rate training that I went to and I don't know why somebody didn't tell me this before, but there's a way to get just your library's info. Going back to your landing page, right underneath the logo there's a welcome and then your library's name. If you click on your library's name there, then you get, this is information about your organization and it's got its own little sub-menu down here where it's got its own news link. When you click on this news link, then you get just your library's items, just your notifications, just your um, questions. Uh, in here you can see I've got the Library Commission's 486 notification letter was sent, um, the 486 was certified, and way, way at the bottom, um, that's acknowledging that the 471 was done, and then it cuts off. So that's how you can just see your library's information, which is what most people really want. They want to know what has been sent to my library, where am I at in the process, is, has USAC contacted me about something. So even though it's right up here, we do just don't click on that news at the top of the blue bar, just, just skip it. Do it this way instead. Go to your library's name, hit its news, and you'll just see the information for your library. Now the second option up in the top blue menu, and I would say that's just, you know, that's when that tip there may be the price admission for this whole workshop that some people had so much trouble with finding just their library's information. Another thing though that is going to be very useful is tasks. The second part of, the second item on your blue menu up there, this is forms that you were in the middle of working on. Uh, if you've started a form and you had to get, you got pulled away, as, as you're working through a form, the system will save as you go. So if you realize, oh wait, I have to look up something, I forgot to look this up before I got in here to submit the form, that's fine. You just log out of your account and you can go find that information and come back and um, continue where you left off here. 
Um, or if you get interrupted, you're in the middle of doing something and a bunch of kids come in and need help in the library and you, you have to you know, go help them. Or if there's a fire drill or something, you know, whatever works, whatever happens, this is where they save as you go. Now, many people have been having trouble with this as well because anytime you start a form, it automatically puts it in here. So going back to our landing page, and this is just I'll back a few screens to show you. Up here in the upper right, it has our FCC form 470, 471, 486. This is where you click to start a new form. And as soon as you click one of these, it the system immediately creates a form in your tasks for you to start working on. Even if you haven't entered any information into that form yet yourself, it has pulled information from your account, your um, your personal account for you, your organization information into that, so, and it started creating a form for you. A lot of people are getting caught up in the confusion with this in that they keep clicking over there when they want to go back to a form, thinking they'll go back and find their list of forms, but that's not how it works. Every time you click on there, it creates a new task for you. So you may have multiple things here of a 471 or a 470, but you're really only working on one of them. And I've had some people, they've got like 10, 15 different ones here, and they don't know why. Um, what it will also do is when you have something in the tasks, the system will automatically start sending you reminder emails, letting you know, hey, you've got this task that you, st you started this form. You might want to continue with it. Um, you have this form to create, and it can get confusing. However, and I'll, I'll show you when we get into a form here, you can clean this up and delete all the ones that are in here that shouldn't be. If you... Um, know which one is you're actually working on or can figure that out by going in and looking at each one of them. The ones that you don't want to use, there's a discard form button in the forms. You just click that, it'll say, are you sure? And you can clear it out of here and clean it all up. So if you do have a lot of these tasks floating around or you keep getting the email saying, you need to create this form because it just takes this phrasing here, create FCC form 471 and it just kind of, it just spits that in mindlessly to an email to you which looks like I need to create a new form. Another one of the bad things about this system. It's not what it really means. It just means it's pulling from this and saying, here, don't forget this is out there. It really means you need to continue with that form. So take a look at your tasks. See if you got some that are floating around in there that shouldn't be and discard them. If you're not sure, let me know. I can get into your account and look at them and let you know which ones I think are real and which ones need to be cleared out. Third item across the top is report records. This is a kind of this is where we get into shoehorning e right into this system. There's a lot of things that are records, reports, and actions actually that are just dumped into various places because they didn't know where else to put them and they just kind of the fall into there. Um, all your forms are here where you can get a list, get into, this is where you would get into any forms you have submitted in all the different areas. Um, you can look at um, appeals if you have put one in, um, different entities, uh, consulting firms, um, customer service cases, and this is another page that's longer than fits on my screen. This is the second half. Um, knowledge base, so articles about different things for, that you might want to learn about with E-Rate. Uh, list of service providers here. You, whistleblower cases, is somebody doing something they shouldn't be in the system. So a whole bunch of different things there, and we'll see where some of them are useful to you to go in and look at. Uh, the fourth section over is reports. Um, this also has a quick link back to your landing page. If you ever unsure of where you are or you don't see this logo to pop yourself back to the landing page, just go to reports. Is, you'll always have this blue bar across the top no matter where you are in the system. You can use that to get back to your home page. Um, for both your 470 and um, 471, after you've submitted it, you can actually make changes if you realize after the fact, oh wait, I, I made a mistake, I, our phone number was wrong, I put the wrong amount in, you can um, make a modification request and those are all here. They also have funding progress reports so you can see how your funding is being processed. Um, this is something that is a work in progress. Uh, they may be, they, they're just, you know, trying to think of other reports that you might like. So if you think you might know something, send an email off to their customer support of if there's something you think you might like to look up for some reason that you can't already do in the system, let them know. 
And the last item across the top is actions. Uh, this is where you can contact their customer service. Uh, create a whistleblower case if you know there's any violations going on and you can look up um, your 470 and 471s here as well to take a look at them. Now back to your landing page. Um, in the upper right you'll see notice there is this little uh, silhouette, head silhouette up here. And this is where you can get into your user account, so you as a person using this um, system. If you just hover your mouse over that head, your name pops up. If you click on it, it actually brings up where you can um, go into your profile, uh, modify from some settings, things like time, uh, time zone, and you can sign out of the system. Now, I recommend always signing out whenever you're done. Um, it does have an inactivity timer of 60 minutes, but it doesn't hurt just to keep getting the habit of when you're done, click here, click to sign out, and you're out of the system. But to go into your profile, this is your personal information about you, you do have where you can, um, this is obviously another thing that they have some sort of like social aspects of this system that you might want to um, use. I don't use it for anything as you can see. You can you can put in a headshot of yourself here. You can put this picture in the background to be different if you want to to edit it. Um, I had someone who said they actually put for this profile picture which always appears in the upper right. I think it was a picture of their dogs because they were, um, whenever I do e rate it's so frustrating. I want something to make me feel good and smile. So I always have my dogs looking at me up there. <laughs> so you can do that with, you can put anything in there. We don't really use this to interact with each other for e-rate purposes the way this might be used in other companies who are using this type of system for something else. But So do with it what you like. But to modify your account, there's an edit profile button here and there's a related actions button here. You can get into manage your Epic user profile. This is specific information, information specific to you as the user. And you can see here you can change your name, phone number, uh, title, address, and then if you scroll down a bit from here, just that's just the rest of the address information. So if you are a new library director coming in, or a new person coming into a library doing E-rate, and the previous person has left, but you're using the same email address, remember I said you can go in and change the password to whatever you want by doing that forgot password because you're still using that same email, then go into user profile and change the name to you. Um, first name, last name, phone number, job title, um, all of that can be changed. So if you are doing that, go in here and you can modify that to be correct. And that's all that's in there in your user profile. It's very basic info. What's great is all that user profile information is automatically pulled into a form whenever you submit it in the E-Rate system. You can also, if you are adding someone, so example, someone new is coming on board who you want to have access to the um, E-Rate system or you are the outgoing director and there is a good transition where you can just um, give the, a new person access, manage users from the landing page is where you would do that. Um, you can create a new user, add and remove existing ones, and then update their permissions. What you do have to do first is check in this box to select the organization that they're going to be in. Now for these independent um, libraries where you're just a single library, this seems a little silly to have to check yourself because you're the only library, but this is, system is also for you know uh, school districts with multiple schools or libraries with multiple branches, so you would have to say where they actually are. But um, if you want to create a new one, you just check that box, hit the create a new user button, and then you just get the same thing, blank info, just like that was on my user account that's already in there. Fill in all the info. At the bottom of the screen, now that you're, when you're creating a new one, is the user permissions that you can set. Full user, where they can do everything. Partial, where they can enter some data but not actually submit. Um, all these different variations that you can possibly have set. And you can set it specific to each form, depending on what's appropriate. If you are the one person doing everything, or you're setting up someone who's the one person that does everything, they actually also have over to the left the apply all pull down, where you can just say full rights for everything. And then boom, 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 it'll just set it full for, for all the way across. So set this however is appropriate for whatever you're setting up. Um, you can also, um, back to your landing page, manage your organization information. This is if 
um, everything about your library. So when you click Manage Organizations from the top there, similar to doing a person's an uh, individual's, you check in the box, and then you click the Manage Organization button, and then you get information about your library. So if you move into a new building, you might need to change your address, phone number, whatever. You can do all that at the top here. Even if your library's name changes, maybe you are now um, it's a memorial library to somebody, or some reason you're changing it. Um, you can change that in here. Latitude and longitude, you do not have to worry about. Um, that is, um, so if you don't know what your latitude and longitude is of your library, don't panic. <laughs> that is something that can be used to figure out your urban or rural status if necessary, but you can see at the bottom, it actually also has that as a separate thing. This is where it's um, pulled in from the census data, or you can select it yourself here if you think it, need, if it needs to be changed. Scrolling down that page, you've got your mailing address for the library, other contact information, email address, website URL if necessary. Scroll down a little bit more and you've got library information. This is the type of library that you are. Now you definitely want to go in here and make sure this is correct for your library, whether you're public or private, and then anything that applies to you that you do. If you are have a bookmobile, if you have a kiosk, um, your main library will always your your library will always be a main branch, and then you might have other things that you'd put in here. This is the one for the commission, so we choose the state library agency because that's where we fall under. Um, this is also where you enter the square footage of your building that is used to calculate that category two budget that we talked about earlier. Um, I don't think this is accurate for the commission. I just wrote 10,000 as a placeholder, but this is where you would enter that information and then it automatically pulls from this to do your calculation. Once you have this um, account here all set up and ready to go, you don't have to enter any of this information again on any of your forms. It automatically pulls it from the organization account info. The last bit of this page is your school district that you're associated with. This is to do that discount calculation as well. Um, if it's not already listed here, you've got a search here where you can look up where what your what is in your zip code and where you are to figure out what your school district is. And then the last thing on here is this FCC registration number. This is a new thing that libraries need to have, part of this new system. And um, it will automatically fill into your forms once you put it in here. Anyone doing business with the FCC now has to have a registration number and put it on their forms. This is something apparently that's been around forever, for a long time, but just now E-Rate is deciding to use it. You can look up your number here. I've given a link to it here, um, which is a very, as you can see, not easy to remember um, link. But I also have it on our website, so you can go there and click on it if you need to. Uh, so, so that's the basics of your EPIC account um, and all the different things that you can look at in there. Any questions about that before we move on to the actual forms? No? All right. We're getting to the home stretch here. Um, well, the going through the actual forms themselves. So I know this is probably what you've been maybe waiting for. <laughs> so the first form in the E-rate process is the form 470. This is a form that is available right now in the fall. Actually it becomes available to use in the summertime. So it's been available for a few months now. It, it officially opens a competitive bidding process is um, what it does. So this is, as I said earlier, public. Everyone out there can see it. The only ones that would care to look at it would be service providers, however. Now, when you're submitting a 470, Form 470, what you're doing is saying, officially what you're saying is, we are looking for someone to, to provide us with this service, whether it's our monthly internet bill, a piece of equipment, installation, whatever. Now, you may be thinking, well, there's only one company in town that does internet for us. This is kind of a moot point. There's not competition, and that's okay. Um, you'll just say that that's who the company you end up going with is the only one that's in town when you go on with the other forms. But in order to get your E-rate discount, you do have to go along with the process, play the game, officially open a competitive bidding process even though there won't be any competition. On the other end, um, other extreme end of that, you may actually get um, contacts from um, providers that you've never heard of before. 
This has happened with many libraries in the state, and I have people mention this in almost every workshop in person that I do. A company from Alabama is contacting me and wanting to give me internet service. What is that? Um, this company who is only serves Omaha is reaching out to me in Scotts Bluff, and what is that all about? Why are they even bothering? I can't tell you why they're bothering. I can guess. My guess is there's a lot of competition out there now, lots of little companies coming up, and they're just doing a fishing expedition for anybody that they could possibly provide services for. Um, a company may see your application and say, oh, we serve Nebraska. I'm going to reach out to this library and offer them our services. Then you respond to them and say, hey, you sound, you sound like you got some good prices here. I'm in so-and-so, you know, McCook, Nebraska. What can you do for me? Oh, we only serve Lincoln and Omaha, is what they may say in response. Okay, that's fine. Then you just delete those emails and don't deal with them. So you may end up, this is what's been happening late, recently in the last, since I've been doing this actually, since 2009 is how long I've been doing E-rate consulting here at the commission. Companies are coming from out of the woodwork. So you may have that, or you may have the other extreme where nothing, nobody contacts you because there's only one company in town, and you just have to deal with it. But like I said, you just go through the steps um, to get your E-rate discount. Um, there is uh, some situations where you do not need to do the 470 every year, potentially. If you have a contract that you've signed with an internet provider with a specific start and end date, meaning as you, we will lock you into this price for the next three years, and then after those three years, you have to sign a new contract with us for the next three years. Then you only need to do a 470 for the first year, the year that you are looking for the service, getting them for the first time. Every other year that you're in that contract, you've already got your provider. You don't need to look again. You don't need to open up the competition again. And you don't want to do that because you will be bringing yourself, make yourself open to the new company coming in, and you got to start all over. If you have a contract, uh, an agreement with a company, which is typically what it is when you're an individual in some libraries where it just goes month to month, you don't sign a new contract every year, it's just, yeah, we signed up with them back in 2010 and they're our provider, and you just monthly pay and nothing really changes, that's not this situation. That is when you would need to every year reapply, let you rate know you're still doing it, the company let them know they're still providing you the service. This is where you specifically signed a contract that has a beginning and a hard end date, and then when that is up, you're going to have to renegotiate with them again. In this, in that case, you wouldn't do the 470. You'd start with the 471, just letting you rate USAC know, yep, we're still with them on year two. Yep, we're still with them on year three. Another situation where you might not have to submit a 470 is this goes into the um, FCC trying to get libraries having good, fast, um, cost-effective, cheap internet access. If you can find a company that provides you with this particular setup where the cost is um, $300 or less a month and your speed is at least 100 megabits per second download and 10 upload, then you do not have to actually open up for competition. You can just say, I found a company that does this, I'm good to go, and you just skip the 470 and go to the 471 and start with that form. Now, um, when I first started talking about this a few years ago, when this first became a thing, most there wasn't. This isn't the kind of thing that's available. 100 megabits per second was unheard of, or not. They weren't weren't there yet. Um, I had one library up in Norfolk actually said it got excited actually when I first did this, which I was surprised. And they said, "Oh, my provider offers us 90 megabits per second. I wonder if I can get them just to go up 10, 10 more." If we can go with that, then everybody skips this whole first process and none of this competition, and you get to skip a whole form for everybody. Um, and unfortunately, they never found out what happened with that. But so look for this if you can find somebody doing this. Also confirm that they're going to stick with it when you do um, get to the 470. So you're going to want to make sure this is a definite thing. They're going to be able to offer you that speed, and it's all good um, when you get to the 471, which won't be until in for us in 2018. Now, to start your 470, now we're going to go through the actual steps of going through a, an example of a four, Form 470, um, going through all the different um, uh, pages of it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions as we're going, if there's something you're confused about, you're not sure where I'm clicking on, type it into that question section. I want to make sure I, everyone knows um, what we're doing as we're going through this form here.
So to start a new Form 470, you click on the FCC Form 470 um, link up here in the top. And there we go. And then it creates a new form for you. Um, right off the bat, it has put this into your tasks instantaneously. We haven't even typed anything in yet, and it's already in there. If you realized you didn't want to start this form, it was a mistake, I, I, I just wanted to back out, or I was really trying to get into one I already started, I didn't mean to check up here, this here on the lower left is where you have your discard form button. Click on that. Um, it will confirm, are you sure you want to discard it? And you say yes. You want to make sure that you clear out anything from here, as I said earlier, because you don't want them to keep sending you email reminders to finish a form that you didn't really mean to start in the first place. So what you do to enter on this first page, if this is a form you're doing, is a nickname. Um, this is something that you create yourself, whatever you want it to be. Um, you're not going to remember every time it, that you, a form is created for you, a new 10-digit uh, number is associated with it. So it'll be FCC Form 470, number 7843279, whatever. You're not going to always remember all those. So you give each form a nickname to indicate what it is um, for. So something you'll remember so you can tell um, when E-Rate contacts you, USAC contacts you with questions, which one they're asking for, or for your own reference, um, which tell you different years forms apart. So for this one, for example, I labeled this one F FY 2018 470. So I know this is my form 470 for funding year 2018. Um, once that's entered, on the right here, you've got save and continue. Save and share, that would be if you needed to send this to someone else to look at. That has to do with those different um, uh, permission levels. So if you can enter the info, but someone else has to approve it, that would be the save and share. Generally, you're the one person doing it, so you just do the standard save and continue. Uh, the second page of the form is nothing for you to enter. This just pulls in information from your organization's info, so all that stuff we had for our library. You'll also notice across the top there's this uh, bar that will move along as you move through the form, basic information, service requests, technical contact info, et cetera, et cetera. As you're going through the form, you'll see that bar move along so you know where you are in the process. So we save and continue this one. Uh, the next basic info is consultant and contact information. Consultant information is um, if you pay a company to help you do your form. There are companies out there that will help usually larger organizations like a large school district or a large um, library system. They will help them submit their applications because there's just too much to do. Um, generally though for libraries here in Nebraska, I don't know of anybody except for briefly for a while ago in the past, Omaha Public used a consultant, but they've switched. So you wouldn't put anything in there. Um, but you would enter contact info. Are you the main person? And you say yes or no. And if you say yes, it just automatically pops in your info from your user account. Save and continue again to the next page. And now we're on to our service requests. And this is where we put in specifically what service and what thing we are wanting to get an E-rate discount on. We ha can do Category 1, just click on that blue button there, that blue box, click on that to do Category 1, or we can click on to do Category 2, or we can do both if we wanted to in one, in one form. Um, up to you which way you want to do it, if you wanted to combine one big 470 that has everything, or if you have some reason to separate them out. Um, you may need to do, may potentially do Category 1 right now because you know I've got a monthly internet bill, easy to just submit a form for that and be done with it. But I'm going to do a category one, category two later because I need to go back and figure out what kind of, if do I need to buy some routers or some switches or some cabling and I'll come back and do a second 470 for those things. Um, for this example, I've done both so you can see a little about how they both look. But once you've selected which ones you want to do, save and continue. It's going to ask you about an RFP, request for proposal or request for quote, it's sometimes call, called. Uh, this would only come into play if you're having, generally when you're having a large construction project, um, something that has so much more to do that you can't fit it all into the, the spots they give you on this form and you've put together an official document saying we're looking for a major construction company to build our new library and here's the 20-page document that explains that. But we want to get an e-rate discount on the things we can, 
you can upload that to the system. There's an upload option on the right, and then anyone who looks at this form for E-rate purposes will have all the information they need to um, decide to respond to you with any sort of um, bid. For my purposes for this example, I'm just going to say no and go on to the next uh, screen, but you can do that there if you um, have if that's your situation. So we save and continue that, and now this is where we can put in the specifics for each category. We've got our category one ability up here and category two below. If I had only selected category one, I wouldn't have an option down here to do category two. And the same way, if I'd only done the form for category two, I wouldn't even have an option up here at the top to do one. So it says there are currently no category one service requests, which is correct because we haven't added, done any yet. So we need to add a new service request. On the next page, it has a pull-down menu for the what you can choose, but before that, it gives you definitions and information about each service request, uh, each, uh, each function that you can possibly ask, ask for. So this is really useful. It didn't used to be in here, and I'm really liking this part. Um, so as an example about if you're doing what we had mentioned earlier, if you're doing least dark fiber, you must use dark and lit as your choice. Um, what you to do with provisional networks, what counts for cell service and voice service here at the bottom. Um, so basically definitions of everything. Something that has been confusing people, libraries a lot over the last few years as we've been doing these new versions of the form, is what to use for your basic monthly internet. And there's three options that seem to fit that category but cause confusion. <laughs> um, the first one down here about the middle is transport only, no ISP service included. Um, then there is internet access and transport bundled, and then there is internet access ISP service only. Some internet companies separate out the transport, that is the um, physically getting the, you know, the, the, the connection to you and the service itself as the two different categories and just for whatever reason how they do it. If your company does this, you'll know because there'll be these weird different, cat, different, different things you have to, um, that will be listed out on your bill. Um, the transport cost is this, and then this is that. Um, and also, as you can see here, um, it gives information about does not include commercial and in, um, internet service other than least dark fiber. So they give nice, lots, lots of tips. Look for these things in the system here. Any of these tips? Generally speaking, though, for your usual monthly internet, you're going to use this middle choice, internet access and transport bundled. That covers your usual companies that just provide you with everything. They get you the connection to your building, and they get you the service that rides on that connection. So that's what we recommend to do. Now, if as you're going along later on you realize I meant something different or I talked to my provider and it's actually something else, that's okay. These things can always be changed. You can always cancel a form and start a new one. If you even if you've submitted it, that can be done. Um, sometimes, depending on the change that needs to be done, you can go in and do a modification. Don't panic if you're you, know, you find out afterwards that something has totally changed. We can always work with that. So I'm going to close up this little these definitions here. There's a little you know, arrow down here and then um, open up the pull-down menu for all the functions that are available. Um, so this is where you can have your lease, lit fiber, internet access and transport bundle, transport only, uh, cell services at the bottom, voice services at the bottom. Um, for this first one, I did internet access and transport bundle, my basic monthly bill. So I click on that, and then there's an add button over here to the right. And then depending on what you choose, it's going to ask you some more questions to give a little specifics. So it's going to vary. Um, in this case, it wants to know a quantity, number of circuits, and it tells you what the unit is for that quantity, how many internet connections are coming into the library. We only have one. And then it has your capacity. This is your speed, minimum and maximum um, that you want. And this actually, if you open up these pull-down menus, goes all the way up to gigabits. Um, as speed because that is becoming available in many places around the country now. So choose what your minimum is you want and your maximum you could possibly get. Now for, for doing this, I rec we recommend doing your maximum of actually over what you're currently getting now. So um, for example, if your company is giving you 25 megabits per second, say you're looking for 50, say you're looking for 100 maybe. It doesn't mean you have to commit to that when you actually choose your service. The 470 is like you're dreaming. What can I possibly get? The 471, the second form, is when you specifically pick what you actually went with. And they can be different. 
but the 470 does have to encompass what you say in the 471. So make this bigger than what you could maybe even think you could get because you don't want to um, you know, knock yourself out of it by saying, well, we only need 25 and then your company says, well, we actually offer 50 now. That's great, but if you didn't put that on your 470, you're only getting an E-rate discount on up to 25 megabits per second speed. You can still pay for and get the 50 from your provider, but you only get a half the discount because you didn't put that down on your 470. So think big on the 470 and don't worry about it. On the 471 is when you'll say what we actually ended up with. Number of entities served, this has to do along with the you know school districts and libraries with multiple branches, but generally you're just one. And then do you need this installed and do you need maintenance on it or not? Um, if this is our monthly internet and it's all, we're, that's what we're still get, or we've been currently getting, um, we don't need these, I just said no. And then you click add. It then reloads that previous page and you can see it started, it's started a little table showing um, what you just created. Now if we want to add another service request under category one, we hit the click this add new service request button again. And this time I'm going to do the voice service. Um, even though I know it's going away, I'm just showing you how can you add another one. So I choose voice and it asks me something different. Unit, it says users, this means number of lines. We have two phone lines, let's say. It's only one single entity and the same thing, it's the phone service we already have, we don't need it installed. We click add and now it has added a second one to our list to our table there. And you just keep going as you want to add all those different category one services. If there's maybe you're going to investigate getting fiber, you'd want to add that as a choice, or whatever. There is a narrative right beneath that. This is a free text box where you can type in more info if you need to. Uh, I wrote here monthly internet service for public library and local and long distance telephone service for public library. So not a requirement, but if you think there might be, it might be helpful to put in a little bit more detail, you can put that there. If we scroll down from here, we've got this installment payment plan question is next, right before the category two. Um, this has to do with all the special construction, getting um, new fiber lines run or something connected to your building. These are high, can be very expensive, high cost, and USAC knows that you, you might not be able to spend, you know, have that whole chunk of money, and they just want to know if you're going to be doing an installment plan. You can arrange with your provider or your construction pump company to do an installment payment plan on those kind of things, and if you're going to be doing that, um, you can uh, let USAC know that here. But if you're not, you'd say no. Now we're going to add a service, uh, category two service, same thing as category one. We click that add new service request button, and then we get a different look because it's what is available in category two. We've got our internal connections, the basic maintenance of them, and that special managed, managed internal broadband service. I'm just going to do an internal connections one, and you can see here I open up the pull down menu, and this is where I've got all those different pieces of equipment that I can get. Um, routers, switches, racks, cables, uh, wireless access points, whatever. Um, I started out with some cable, so I wrote cable, chose cabling from the pull down. It's going to want to know how many feet I want. I wrote 500. I have no idea if that's accurate for what you'd need to do, like a new lab or whatever. So don't quote me. <laughs> if that's not right, um, that, yeah. Uh, manufacturer. You can choose a certain brand or manufacturer if you have a preference, if you want to. Um, there's a, you open up this, this, there's a huge long list. If you don't care, you can just say no preference. Um, number of entities, we're just a single library still. And in this case, yes, I would like someone to install it because I don't know anything about installing internet cabling in my in my library. So yes, we do want that installed. We click add, and now under the category two, it's got that started, that table started. Now I'm going to add a couple of more services here. I'm not going to go through the whole process that I just did for category one and two because I think you can see that it's the same every time. It's just specific to what service you're asking for. So I've gone through a couple of times now and added a router and three wireless access points. And you can see they just add them to the list. So you would then just go through your category two and for every piece of equipment you think you might be getting this year that you want to do, you would add new ones um, to there. When you're done, this is a view of the full page. Um, pretty hard to read here, I'm sure, but um, this is just wanted you to see what it looks like as a full screen. You've got your category ones at the top, um, your narrative if needed, installment payment plan, 
I said no, and then the category two is at the bottom. So that's the full view. And basically you just go through that and just keep adding things as you need to for whatever you're going to want until you're done. And when you're done, you notice at the bottom there's a save and continue button. You hit that and it goes to the next step in the process. And you can see the blue bar across the top has moved along. Technical contact person. Do you have a specific person separate from you who you would prefer that they call with technical questions? Um, do you have a techie person, uh, you know, if you're the director and you're like, you, you know, big picture, but you don't know the details of how many cables I need, um, this is what you put in here. If you don't, you can say no, and then they'll just contact you. But I said yes, and you can have them have their own Epic account if they need to be in your E-rate system for some reason. That would depend. Um, some tech people, they don't care about E-rate. They just know the you know, your network, um, and they don't need an account. But you can enter their details manually if they don't need access to your Epic account, and that's what I've done here. Um, Sue Storm is my IT person. There's her phone number and email address, and that's who they can contact for more info. Save and continue on to the next page. State or local procurement requirements is their next question. This is if there are any local or state laws that require how you can look for services. Um, sometimes there may be, depending on, you know, for bigger projects like a building project, that would be something you'd have to look at in your local or um, city or county rules and see if there is something along there. Um, for the state as a whole, there isn't. Um, so I just said no for this. If there was, you would then let them know what those rules might be. And that's the last step of the form of information that you're adding. And now, instead of save and continue, we can review the, uh, the form before we submit it. And what it will do is it will generate a PDF. Um, if this was a active screen, it's got that little swirly there in the middle that would be going around and around like they do when a PDF is trying to load and it's waiting. Unlike any other PDF in the world, it will not automatically pop up when it's done. You have to keep checking. And that's what this refresh button in the lower right is. You're going to have to click that and see if it's done. If it's not, it'll just reload this page, still showing it's generating. And you might have to click, click it multiple times. I've generally had to do it two or three. I click it, I wait 20 seconds, click it again, wait another 20 seconds, and the third time it comes through. You never know. You're just going to have to keep clicking until it is ready. You could also, up here on the top, save a draft at this point and wait and come back if you wanted to. But when it is done, you'll get this instead. Instead of showing that it's still generating, it will have a link to download it, and then a box to check certifying the information is correct. Here we have our options to what we can do to certify it. Certifying it is signing off on the legalities and submitting it. Send for certification is if you need to send it to a different person. That's when I was talking earlier about multiple people. You know, I can enter the info, but my director has to sign off on it situation. Um, but if it's just me, the continuous certification is what I click. Right now, it's not a dark blue button. It's kind of grayed out because I haven't checked this box yet because I haven't looked at They want you to look at your PDF. Um, if you're sure that it's okay, you can just check the box and go ahead. But you can also click on the link there and get a PDF. It'll just open it up for you. And this is all the same information that we entered in our form. Our library info, our um, contact info, the different requests that we did, service one, uh, category one, category two, and then our technical contact down at the bottom. This then you could, this is just a regular old PDF, print it out, down, save it, whatever you wanted to. You can also save a finished version of it later. But once you're sure that it's all good and ready to go, you check in that box and then you continue to certification. It's now once you've checked that box, that button becomes active for you. It'll pop up and will say, this will send you directly to certification. Are you sure you want to submit? You say yes. And then this is the full screen of what you're going to get. This is all the certifications. This is all the legalese that you've got to check off on saying, yes, I agree to all the rules of the program. I'm not trying to break any of them. We are an eligible library, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to zoom. I zoomed in a little bit here so you can see the specific certifications. On the 470, you just have to check every box. There's no, well, no thinking. You should, you know, realize you're agreeing to all the legalities, but every single box does need to be checked before it will let you certify. 
Um, I certify the applicant includes libraries. I certify that um, if there is an RFP, it'll be available. I reviewed all the rules. I'm going to follow them, et cetera, et cetera. Once you've selected all of them, this blue certify button in the lower right will become clickable, just like previously. And when you click on it, you see it's blue. Um, then the little scary legalese thing pops up. Default statements on this form may result in civil liability and or criminal prosecution. That's true. It is, you know, this is a federal program, so this is just a scary, you know, make sure you weren't lying or trying to, you know, steal anything, any money. Um, but you do say yes to submit the form, and then it's submitted. What you can do now is you can, and that's the last step, you can look up the form. Back to your landing page, at the very bottom it says FCC forms and post-commitment requests. I've zoomed in on that. You can now look up and see the status of your form to make sure that it's been if you're if you're iffy, if you're concerned, this is what I always do. You can look up all the different types of forms down here, 470, 471, the funding year, and then you'll get results. Um, here you can see I've got two 470s that came up, one certified, one incomplete. The certified one is the one that I've done. It was good. It got submitted. The incomplete one is one that I um, haven't finished. Either I still need to or it was a mistake because I just started it but didn't finish it. One of those ones floating around in my tasks. In this case, I use the commission's account to test forms and see how things work, so I was working on F470. So that's what's that's how the nickname can be important too. You can see what you are doing for each form potentially and decide if it's something that um, you should be continuing with or not. Here now you can click on the nickname and you will see the web version of the full form. Similar to that PDF, but here and then you can print that out if you want to or download it, scan it, whatever you need for your records. Any questions about the 470, submitting it? You still all out there, I hope? Hi. <laughs> all right. Once the 470 has been received by um, USEC, you will receive a receipt notification letter. Um, this is a misnomer now that everything is done with the epics within the epic system within your online account previously it was a physical letter that was actually mailed to you and came as a piece of paper in the mail um, now it's all done within your online account um, it summarizes what you've submitted and you can make changes if you nest if you need to it also gives you a very important date the allowable contract date because we were are officially opening up a competitive bidding process we need to let give potential companies a certain amount of time legally to contact us. The FCC has determined that is 28 days. So you have to wait 28 days before you can do the second form in the process, the 471, and let them know who you picked. Basically, you're letting any companies contact you potentially. This letter will let you know what that date is. It comes to you here in your news. Uh, telling you uh, FCC Form 470 was successfully posted. This begins the 20-day competitive bidding process. The allowable contract date is, and this is ours for 2016, for 26-2016. This is very important. You can not go and do a 471 before that date. If you do, you've um, a lot. Some libraries jump the gun and go ahead and do that and um, if you do that too soon you will knock yourself out completely of getting any any e-rate uh, funding you will be um, just you'll be your, your your application will be turned down um, so always make sure you wait for that time to pass um, before you jump uh, ahead and do it this is also where if you wanted to you've got links down here to make any changes if you need to, to the 471 What's a really cool thing about the new system is when your allowable contract date is reached, they will proactively email you, which I think is awesome. And this is actually sent to just your regular email account. This isn't just within the Epic system, so you don't have to keep going in there and checking, going in there and checking. This is just a screenshot from my email where it's told me Epic notification, allowable contract date reach. And it tells you the date's been reached. You may now close your bidding process and go and and go on to the next step which is the um, form 470 it also does put a copy of that in your news so you have a 
letter um, in there as well that you know your contract date has been met has reached but I think this is really slick I really like this one this is the kind of notification that's good to get <laughs> not unlike the ones from your um, tasks that are not really tasks that you wanted to do um, this one is very very useful So, competitive bidding process. Um, I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as I can because generally most of our libraries in Nebraska don't end up having to get into this because you just have the one company in town, it's the one you're always going to go with, and that's fine. You don't, have, you don't necessarily have a competition. Um, but as I said at the beginning, talking about the 470, you do have to go through the motions of the process for E-rate in order to get the funding. So you do your 470, you wait 28 days, then you look and see if you did get multiple contacts, if um, multiple companies did potentially contact you. Um, and you evaluate them, choose who you're going to go with. If you need to sign a contract, sign one. Um, if it's just your same company, you might just have a little email conversation with them. It's like, hey, we're still doing this. Great. We're on board. Um, and then you do your 471. Now, the 471, this is something, eh, went too far, that has, as it mentioned here, an application filing window. The Form 471 is only available during a certain small bit of time during the year. It runs for about 75-ish days. Um, and it varies every year. Um, it's only available for that short time, and it varies as to when that window, as they call it, opens and closes. Right now, we don't know what that is. They have not announced when it's going to be. We think it's going to be sometime in January 2018 for this year, which means it would close sometime in March. Um, exact dates to be determined, to be announced. This is something uh, related to this that a lot of people ask me regularly is, what is the deadline for submitting the 470? What is the deadline for starting my E-rate process? Because that's what the 470 does. Right, and the deadline for the 470 is related to the window for the 471. Whatever the end date, the closing date of the filing window is, 28 days before that, you just count back 28 days, that's the deadline for the 470. Because that's the latest date you can possibly do a 470 and then still have 28 days before you can do your 471, the last date you can do your 471. So that's the deadline. However, we do not recommend that you wait that long. Please, please don't. Um, <laughs> If you do wait until the deadline for the 470, the only date you have now to do the 471 is the final date of the window. If, and guarantee, too many people do wait that long or just for whatever reasons have to, their servers at the USAC will get bogged down, might be slow, they might have issues with the disk system. There might be a power outage at your library, you can't get online to do it. There might be a blizzard and you can't get to work to do it. Um, there's too many things that could happen that could cause problems with you not being able to get it done on that last date because that is the last possible date and if you miss that date you are out of the window they call it the, you can submit outside of the window but you are way down on the um, possibility of getting in your funding and you might just get uh, rejected completely because you're out of the window so don't wait for the 470 deadline don't even wait for it to be announced go back to your library Tomorrow, you know, today we're, we're ending pretty late in the afternoon. Tomorrow, go back and start working on your 470 now. There's no reason to wait. Get it in, get it started, get that count started of those 28 days. Then you know definitely by the time um, the window opens in January, you would have gotten those 28 days. And then you can just jump right into the 471 when it does become available. So that's my strong recommendation to you to just jump on right away. Don't wait until the last minute. When that window is open, I will announce it everywhere. When, when those dates are announced, I will announce it everywhere so you will know when it is open, when is the actual deadline for the 470. But I checked right before we started today with this webinar. They still haven't announced it yet, so keep your eyes and ears open for something from me. Competitive bidding, back to that quickly. Um, must choose the most cost-effective bid. It, this is only something you have to do if you have more than one company that contacts you and they are actually responding to something you actually asked for in the 470. So for those companies, like I said, that don't actually serve our area, toss them, don't even worry about it. If you reach out to them because they look like they're in Nebraska but they say, oh, we're only in Omaha, 
delete them. You don't have to even do this. Um, if you have somebody contact you and they offer you something that's not what you put in your 470. For some reason, I had this happen a lot with um, the Library Commission. I actually submitted um, the E-rate application for the commission. We applied for telephone every year. We have now phased out of that because of the discount going down. I would regularly be contacted by companies offering me cell phone service. We don't have cell phone for the commission. We had local, long distance, and a couple 800 numbers. And that's all that was on our Form 470 application. You will receive notifications saying, I am contacting you in response to your Form 470 Bob, for funding year you know, 2018. And here's the services we offer. And they'd say, we've got great cell phone plans. And these are our you know, rates and whatnot. I didn't ask for phone, for cell phone. I can just delete those and ignore them. So only, you only have to deal with this if you receive more than one contact from companies actually serving your area and actually offering you the services you asked for. The key is that it's cost the most cost effective bid. And here is a chart that gives you an, a, a definite example of how, what that means. Cost effective isn't always just cheapest. You take in consideration multiple things to decide who you're going to go with. You do to want to look at the price, but there's other other things that are going to be important to you. Prior experience: Are they your current company? Um, are they flexible on giving you your discounts? Are they good for the environment? Are they local or not? You decide what these things all that all these things are that matter to you. Assign them points, giving price the highest number of points, but not the most. So you can see here, price gets 30 points. Everything else is 20 or less. And that's correct. And then when you get your potential bids, you compare them, give them their points based on what you put over here. You can see here, vendor number two got the full 30. That means they're probably the cheapest. But vendor three got the higher number of points in the end, and that's the one you go with. And you can see here, the key here was they're our current company. This is a new guy in town. This is what you can assume here from the, these guys getting zero and these having a full 20. And this is correct for you getting picking this vendor. The fact that this one's cheaper, USAC will be totally fine with that. If you do have multiple contacts, do something like this to document why you chose who you chose. Because USAC can come around and ask for um, more information about why you picked who you picked. Um, that 10 years that you have to keep documentation, they can go back 10 years to double check on something you did if they want to. This vendor, vendor number two, may notice you picked a different company and they may go to USAC and say, hey, we know we were cheapest in town. Why didn't they pick us? We want an investigation. And they may ask you, well, can you explain why you picked vendor three or vendor two? If you have this, you're good to go. You just show this to them and say, well, here's why. This was our decision-making process. We took price into account the most, but there was other things that mattered. And you're good. Like I said, there's a 95% chance you'll never have to do this. Most likely, you'll get this situation. No bids or only one. If you receive only one bid, that's fine. You can just go with them. You don't need competition. You aren't required to find another company to compare. Just write a dot yourself a memo or email yourself a note saying, only so-and-so contacted us. That's who we're going with. If you didn't get any bids, this happens often where your current provider just assumes you'll continue with them. Then you, can re then you can reach out to them and ask, can you just send us something, submit something, let us know that we're going to continue because I need some documentation to prove to USAC and E-rate if they ever ask that we're still going with each other. So this is a more likely situation, but I do explain the competitive bidding because in case that comes up, um, you'll know what, what you're talking about. So any questions about the Form 470? Before we move on to the next form. Now, um, we officially have about 10 minutes-ish left in the session. We did start a little late, however, because of um, my, my mistake of having the wrong link sent out. So um, we did start a little long, a later than we, um, we didn't start exactly at 1.30 like we're supposed to. Um, so um, we will probably go beyond 4 p.m., our official original start time. Um, but 
I just want to make sure I get everything in here. Uh, I will. Everything is being recorded, however. So if you did only, you know, say you were only going to do this till four, that's okay. If you need to leave, don't worry. Um, we're recording all the way to the end. You'll have the archive that you can watch if you for anything that you missed at the end. The second form in the E-rate process is the form 471. This is the one where you let USAC know who you ended up choosing. Um, you, this is the discount calculation is put in here. You say who you picked, how much it's going to cost from them, um, what you end up going with. At this point, USAC recommends, con this is when you would contact your provider and confirm exactly what you're getting, what um, the speed's going to be for your internet, what you're going to be buying from them if you're going to be doing, what, how the everything's going to be installed, construction, if any of that needs to be done, um, and talk to them about how you're going to be invoiced. That's how you're going to receive your discount, um, discount on your bills or um, reimbursements, and we'll get to that in a second. Also, just to remind you, this is after the 28 days has passed, after you've got an agreement in place, then you do the 471. If I knew the filing window, this would have the dates on my slides, but it's to, to be announced because we still don't know. Um, and this is the one that you do do this every year. Um, but you wait those 20 days and you wait for the window to open. You can't even get into the 471 until that window opens, so you can't jump the gun for that at least. It's just not even um, physically able to do it. Um, now, to get to the 471, it's just like the 470, it's in the upper right. For the 471 and all the other forms in the process, I do not have the full screenshots of the whole process like I did for the 470 because, as I just mentioned, for example, the 471 you can't go on with, it's not available. But I've got some info about them and details. Um, these are things also you won't be doing until next year anyways. But you click the 471. That looks very similar to the start of the 470. You've got your bar across the top that will you'll go through the different parts of the form, give it a nickname, and go on to the different um, to enter all the information about um, your funding request. You'll see the second part is your entity information. That's your library's info that's automatically dumped in there, and then your funding request is the next part. I do have a slide here though that explains how the funding requests work. Um, each thing that you ask for an E-rate discount on is a specific funding request. So your monthly internet bill, your monthly voice services, I bought a router, I'm having construction done, each of those things is a separate funding request. They are each assigned a funding request number as you create them in the system. After each one of those is request, is funding requests is created, then you have to put in the um, cost information, the details about how much you're paying for it. So this is kind of a, there's two parts to a funding request, creating the request itself and then putting in the costs. This is a way, place where some people kind of get lost. They've created the request and they don't know why it's giving errors. If you haven't entered money information, that's the best way I can describe it, and a cost amount in a 471, you haven't finished creating a request. And it's a multi-screen, multi-step process too. Like even like on the 470 where you had to do multi-steps to get something in there, same kind of thing. You gotta create, say you're looking for a service, and then on the next screen what it costs what the next service is, and then what it costs, and on and on for each one, one at a time. Now, this is the one form, though, that for Category 1 and Category 2, you do have to submit separate 471 forms. You can't do them all on one form like you could for the 470. This is because of how that discount calculation is done. For the Category 1, it's just a discount percentage off. For the Category 2, it's that budget. Their system can't do both of those kind of math on one form. So if you are applying for both category one and two, you'll do um, a single, potentially, a sing you can do a one, a single 471, but when you get to the four, 470, I'm so sorry, 470, when you get to the 471, you'll have to do two, one for all your category one services and one for all your category two services. You'll then put in your, you'll choose your different types of services, this case was internet access, digital transmission, and then the line items is what it's talking about, the specific cost of each thing. Um, those funding request numbers are important to remember, to know about, because that is when USAC may call you with questions, that's what they'll refer to, funding request number so-and-so. Um, each service provider has a what they call a SPIN number. This is something else to be aware of, uh, service provider ID number. Um, 
sometimes they may have more than one depending on what services they do. Sometimes they just have one, it's for everything. Sometimes for whatever reason they want to be, a, to be um, identified as a different company for different services. So if you're doing something new with them that you've never done before, you might, you, it would be a good idea to double check to make sure what spin number they want you to use. Otherwise you might not um, get connected with Get your your rate might have a little disconnect there if you don't have the right one. Um, if it's the same, you know, you're just doing your monthly internet and it's the same one you've been doing for the past five years, you're probably fine to go. But anything new, double check with them. After you submit your 471, just like the 470, you get a receipt notification letter, acknowledgement, you can make changes to it um, if you need to. It goes into your news item, just like with the 470, and this is where you can um, uh, make any changes if necessary. And this is where you go into application review. This is where you wait. Um, this is where USAC then will look at your application and um, see if it's everything's correct on there, see if your services are correct, if you are eligible. Um, they may. This is where they may contact you to ask for more information. Um, so basically you do the 470, 471, and then you sit back and wait. And this may take months. And I do mean months and months and months. There are some libraries for four set for the 2017 funding year, which actually did start in July, that as of today are still waiting for their answer from USAC on if they're going to get a discount or not. This is a long ongoing process. They have generally 60 some odd thousand applications to go through, so it can take some time, especially with all the new things. So you do need to be prepared to pay your bills in full at the beginning of the funding year, just in case it takes them a while to get your application. So keep that in mind as you're applying for E-rate. If they do contact you for more info, this is the group in USAC, Program Integrity Assurance, who will reach out to you. Um, they will send you, you will get an email to your regular email address that says, we have a question, go into your Epic account to answer it. Sounds kind of weird and convoluted, but they want all of the questions and answers kept in your account in one place, so you guys both have the same one place to go find everything. So you get an email that says that, they're going to give you 15 days to respond. If you can't get back to them, you can get an extension, so don't panic if it takes you a long time or you don't know. Um, they tell you um, where to go to answer all the um, the inquiries in your form. Um, so this is just the steps to go into it, in the, and there's a link actually from the email that gets you to there. Related actions, respond to inquiries is this is the mail is the menu uh, option. I don't have screenshots of that because I haven't had any questions asked of me, but that's just to give you an idea of where to go. Now, if you do get these and you don't know what the heck they're asking for or you can't figure out how to get to it, this is where you call me. USAC, for whatever reason, I suppose for legal reasons, likes to write a four-page letter asking you for more information when it could be like three sentences. It's just there, you know, like there's legalese, I call it USAC ease. <laughs> Uh, they, it's long drawn out. Sometimes it's hard to interpret what is it they mean, what do they really need from me. If you're un, if you're unsure, if you're confused, if you can't figure out what they're asking for, contact me. This is where I help libraries a lot. I can get into your, you give me your login info. I can look in your account, see what they asked for, and I can translate for you. That's probably like 50% of my job as ERA coordinator, of public libraries, is translating USAC. Uh, anything from USAC for you guys, for the libraries. So if you get a, re re you know, immediately let me know if you're not sure and I can work with it on you and we can get an answer to them so that you can get your funding. So do not be afraid about that. Um, don't panic. Um, sometimes it's just they weren't sure about something. Um, they might want a copy of a bill just to make sure, you know, just a spot check type thing. You, you never know what they may be asking for. And it doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. It just means they need clarification on something. Um, with all the new rules and things going on, it seems to be coming up a lot more often. But um, that's what I'm here for. We can get you through it. We can get your answer to them and get things moving along. Now, once they are done with their evaluation, they've gotten all the answers they want from you, they um, are um, ready to give you their answer, you get a funding commitment decision letter. 
Once again, not an actual letter, it's a notice that comes to your Epic account. And this tells you if you've been funded or not, or if it's been reduced, whatever. Um, you may be get more than one of these. They may break up, and I've seen this happen now with libraries. They may look at your Category 1 application uh, services first, get all that done, and then go back and look at your Category 2. So you may get a funding commitment decision that's just about your Category 1 things, but you're still waiting on the other one. So just getting one of these doesn't mean everything's done. It, you need to look at it and read it and see um, what exactly they um, funded for you. This is where some people lose it in the process, as in they get this funding commitment letter, it says, you have been funded for this amount of money, congratulations, and they say, yes, I did my E-rate, I'm done. No, this is not the end. That is actually just a notice saying, we have set aside this much money, this money for you, you need to let us know if you want it. And that's what the info is used to prepare your 486, that form I told you about, the third form in the process where you say, yep, we want the money you set aside for us. So, don't like think I'm done. I got my I got my notification. I did it all. You still got to let them know that you actually want the monies after this. So when your funding commitment is done, you will get an email sent to your main your personal email account, not just within your um, Epic account. So that's nice. A little nudge saying, "Hey, your funding commitment letter's been done," and it will say you need to go into your Epic account to um, generate the notification and look at it and see what it all says. So when you log into your Epic account, up at the top of your landing page, you choose under notifications, your FCDL, Funding Commitment Decision Letter, whatever the funding year is, and um, once you enter those two, then it will automatically just reload the page and list your notification letter here. Um, when you first bring it up, it has um, the date it was issued, and then over on the right, it says Generate Notification. You have to click on that, and then it will reload the page, and now it says view notification, and it says who generated it and when. It's just some weird technical thing behind the scenes, similar to um, reviewing your PDF of your form, your 470s, that you need to just have it generate, generate that officially. You can then view it. It will then bring it up, pop you over to your news, where it has this um, thank you for your funding, your application, this post contains your funding commitment decision letter, just some general stuff about it, and then this is longer than my screen. Below that, I'll link to information about it, and then this here with a little paper clip, this is a spreadsheet with the details about your um, money, how much you're getting and what it's for. It's also listed out here in more general terms um, that it is, this is the total amount we were approved for, um, zero denied, and um, what the funding commitment uh, application form and I'm identifier was all the you know the details of it um, so you can look at this if you can look especially if you want to otherwise all this information is there in your e-rate account already and ready to dump into your 486 if you don't agree with their decision if you think you were denied incorrectly or um, reduced incorrectly you can do an appeal there's information on the USAC website about how to do that um, you'd appeal to SLD, which is USAC's Schools and Libraries Division. If they don't um, approve your appeal, then we bump it up to the FCC. Um, they're pretty good at this, um, looking at them and evaluating them. Um, it can take some time, though. This is not an instantaneous, oh, let me check. Oh, you're right, that box is just checked wrong. Two days later, you have your money. Appeals take a long time. They've already gone through that long process of evaluating your application when they did that the PIA review. Um, so. Be, be prepared to pay in full or have your bills, bills out there until this process does end. Let me know if you want help with that. So once you've got your funding commitment letter, you've generated it, you're ready to do your 486, where you are letting USEC know that you want the money. What is awesome about the 486 is that all the information you need is already in EPIC and just auto fills your 486 form. There is practically nothing you have to enter yourself. This is one of the huge, great, awesome things about the Epic system. 486, up in the upper right hand corner of your landing page. Um, same thing, you have to give it a nickname, but in this case you do have to choose what funding year you're looking for and who you are as a contact person. Um, 
Once you got those in there, it automatically on the next screen lists all of your funding requests, the things that you had created on that 471 of the specific details of each item that you were getting, um, what it costs and everything, and the fact over here on the right you can see FRN status funded. These are all the things that have been approved for you. They're up here at the top. If you needed to do a search, you could, but you don't have to if it's you know, already, already bringing up the right ones. And then all you got to do is select them. You've got to check in the boxes in front of them and mark all of them and to add to your form. That's what this little gray button here you can barely see says. There's also a button that says add all four if you just want to click that and do them all at once. Once you do that, they just it just pump, pops them down to the bottom and they are now selected. So you've got to check them all. Reload the screen, the atom, the screen reloads. Once you've got them listed as selected, then it will let you go on to the next step of just finishing up the form. Easy. As you can see, you see all of these funding request numbers. You don't even have to enter them. They're already there for you. What they were for, what the amounts are, it's already all in there. Certifications in the 46 are something you've got to pay attention to. Unlike the 470 and the 471 where you just kind of check them all because they all apply, this is where you've got to pay attention and make sure you check the right things, otherwise your form could be held up in the process. Early filing is only if you happen to get your funding commitment before July 1st. And that would be great if you did, then you're doing it early, as in we're answering all these things and submitting it before the funding year starts. If it's after July 1st, you don't check that. SIPA waiver is if you're, you got to read these certifications here. Waiver of SIPA requirements for the second funding year in which you have applied for discounts. If we, um, if, so when you are first getting started with doing internet and complying with SIPA, they actually do, if you don't already have um, filters in place and you're working on figuring out how to do it, they give you three years to do that. First year is your first application. Second year, you're still in the process. Third year, you've got to have it in place and be able to certify that you're in compliance. If you don't, then you've got to step back and not get any of those monies. So this is only if you're in that second year. The next screen of certification, and there's a second screen of certifications in the 46. The first one is um, having to do that technology plan. We just ignore that now and leave it blank. It's still kind of hanging out there. Um, the other two boxes you just check off, these are the legalese of yes, I'm complying with the pro program. The SIPA certifications, this is where you've got to pick one and you've got to pick the correct one. We had quite a few libraries in um, the last year for some reason, 2016, that selected the wrong certification. They said they didn't need to be in compliance even though they were applying for internet. Their applications have been held up. It's been some weird either people put, picking the wrong one by accident or some technical thing behind the scenes. We're not sure. But double check. When you select these, you'll see here this green, the button here says preview. You can double check and make sure you check the right one before you actually submit. The first one is I certify that um, I'm in compliance with SIPA because I'm doing internet. The second one is another of we're in the middle of working on it that second year. And the third one is that it does not apply because we're only applying for telecommunications. Telecommunications meaning telephone, which is being phased out. So unless you're doing just phone because you're one of those last few people still holding on, you got to be one of the other two. Either you're in process of becoming in compliance with SIPA or you already are in order to do E-rate. So just be aware of that, pay attention, make sure you check the right boxes there. Now, the deadline for the 46 is 120 days after service start date, which is July 1st generally, or 120 days after you get your funding commitment letter if it comes after the July 1st date. Now, if um, end of October ends up being the deadline for if you've gotten the letter before July 1st. Sometime in the beginning of October, you may get an email from me nudging you to, if you have not done this yet. I do pay attention. I can look up and see who's done their forms, when the deadlines are coming up. I can you know, see that you, you still need to finish something and that your deadline's coming up. And I will proactively email you directly. This is not just a general, hey, everybody, make sure you check. I specifically look up and only email to the specific libraries who don't have their form in. So you will get an email from me potentially saying, you're receiving this because you have not done your 46 yet, and that means you haven't. <laughs> you must go in and do it, so pay attention if you do hear from me. I do this. This is part of my job is to nudge you and make sure you don't miss any of your deadlines so you can get all of your monies.
You will get a notification letter um, sent to you and your service provider in response to doing your 486, just like all the other ones. Um, and that's what this is. Your Form 46 notification letter is available, has been posted, and you can go there into your Epic account and look at it if you want to. Any questions up into here? We're almost up to the last form in the process. Alright, the last thing you need to do for your E-rate application is the what they call the invoicing. This is um, 472 or 474 depending on your situation. You can either pay your bills in full and get reimbursement afterwards or you can have your service provider discount your bills right off the bat. If you are going to pay your bills in full, you would submit what they call the BEAR form, the Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement form. Um, if you are going to be getting discounts on your bills, your service provider would do the SPY form, the service provider invoice form. That at this point, this is the one where I told you the third, the fourth form, fourth forms in the process depends on your situation. Um, if you're doing the SPY, they're just going to discount your bills. You don't have to do anything. It's the service provider's responsibility to ask USAC for their reimbursement and then pass on the discount to you and your bills. If you're doing the bare form, it also has a deadline that happens to be the end of October as well, just like the 46, but this is 120 days after the last service date, June 30th. You see they kind of fall one day from each other. If you haven't done a bare form for a particular year, I can look up and see if you haven't done that and if you've, whether or not you've gotten the service provider form done. And I will send you an email about that as well at the beginning of October. So you might get multiple emails from me at the beginning of the month of October. One saying, hey, you still haven't done your 46 for the current year. And one saying, hey, you haven't done your bear for the last year. Pay attention, read your emails. Like I said, I'm trying to make sure you get everything done by your deadlines. Now, bear payments now are only done by direct deposit. So you do have um, electronic bank transfers into whatever bank account you say. They used to in issue checks that would go through your service provider and then to you. No more of that. It's just all um, online. So you do have to provide them with uh, banking information. This is a one-time thing. Form 498, you go in and give them your, the usual banking info. If you've ever done direct deposit for your job, you know, it's your bank account information, uh, routing numbers, all the usual. Um, that You will need to know your federal employer ID number, tax ID number, that your payroll person, someone at the city may know that if you don't know it. Um, something new you'll have to know also is um, have is a DUNS number, Dun & Bradstreet number. This is also used to doing business since you're doing direct deposits with the government. You can look up to see if you already have one and apply for one if needed. This kind of number and also that way back at the beginning of the app, um, I talked about the FCC registration number. These are instant almost um, things that just take a second. You apply them for them online and you have an email and you've got your number. The 498 is in a different form than everything else. It's not up here with these other ones because it's a special case form. You go to the your name underneath the logo, related actions here, and then about halfway down the page is create the form 498. And I'm not going to enter, show you any of this with our bank information, but as you can see, it looks very similar to the other forms. You just go through the process of the financial contact info, organization numbers, remittance information that you build, your um, banking numbers, all that, and submit it. After you submit it, they will ask you for some sort of proof. Just like when you do direct deposits, you do need to do a voided check, or in this case, they'll also expect, accept a um, bank statement. So you'll get an email. This is, an, as you can see, this is an email sent to your regular email address, not within the Epic system, saying we need um, the documentation, and they send you to a specific secure website to log in and up and input this information. It is not in the same Epic system with all of your other stuff, so it is kept safe and secure elsewhere. Once you update that information, then they will issue you what they call an ID number, the 498 ID, and you'll be able to do your bear, the reimbursement form, you get your discounts. All of this is only necessary if you're paying your bills in full and then getting a reimbursement after the fact. If you're just getting discounts on your bill from your service provider, you don't need to do any of this. They're just giving you a cheaper bill. 
so this will only depend. The bare form is the one form that is that I mentioned that is still in the old legacy system. It's not in the Epic account, the Epic system yet. So in order to get to your bare, you have to go over here on the main USAC website under forms. It's the 472. You see it's a build entity applicant reimbursement bear form. You can follow it online. I'll also mention here while I'm showing you this, in this form section, USAC has a lot of really good user guides and help and videos about how to use all their different forms. I strongly recommend looking at these if you're unsure about how to do anything in a form. They're all updated for the new versions of the forms. Um, I actually use those myself many times when you guys ask me questions about where do I input this, why do I input this, this is where I go to. But to do a bear, you file online here, and this is, goes into the old legacy system. You may remember it. Um, this is where you will need the one place you still need that old PIN number. If you don't remember it, you've lost a piece of paper, you need a new one, you just call contact USAC from their website, and they can get you a new one. Um, you will get a notification that your bear has been submitted. Um, and then you'll start getting actual, and this is actually that, the bear online form has been accepted, so you know that it's been submitted. You'll also get quarterly reports that will let you know what has been deposited into your bank account or, and or, what has been sent to your service provider that they should then be discounting you. Pay attention to these reports. They come in your email. This is the one that we got for the commission. Um, so just your regular email account, not built into your EPIC. Um, it's an E-rate program remittance statement. In this case, it shows all of the bear payments that we had received. If there was service provider invoice ones where they had gotten money, it would list those. Pay attention to these reports and compare them to the bills you're getting from your service provider. If they're supposed to be giving you a discount, make sure they are. This letter being sent to you means USAC has sent them money send them the money that they should then be cutting off, taking off of your bills when they send them to you. Double check all that and make sure it's happening. Also, double check that these got deposited into your bank account. I actually sent this to our business manager and she told me not even in a day or two that, oh yeah, it was already in the bank account. It's, it's that quickly for the direct deposits of the um, bear reimbursements. So pay attention when you get these. And that's actually the last step of the E-rate process is getting your monies. Yay. So I've just got a last few, last few slides of some info, but does anybody have, you haven't had any questions the whole time. I, I hope that's okay. I hope um, I'm not going too fast or too anything. Do you have any questions you want to ask me before we wrap up? I've just got, like I said, two or three more slides with just some info. Um, type into the questions section and I can answer any burning questions you have about E-Rate right now before we wrap up for the afternoon. Yeah. Are you out there? Hello? <laughs> I see you I, guys logged in. All right, well, if um, you don't have any questions, that's fine. Um, if you do need to contact USAC um, to get an EPIC account, to get a PIN number, this is their 800 number. Their client service bureau is what they call their customer support. You can also submit a form online. Oh, okay. Oh, good. We have a comment. Thank gosh. People are there. Um, no questions right now. Someone says, I just appreciate you're going over everything. Thank you. I Thank you very much. I especially like your tip on finding out, finding just our library's forms. Yes. It's, there's so many different parts in this EPIC system, it sometimes can be hard to navigate it. And I hope some of these screenshots and some of the things on the uh, presentation will point you in the right direction. Thanks for that comment, Beth. Um, Schools and Libraries News Briefs, I'd mentioned this when I was showing the news. This is a weekly newsletter if you want to get from them. It's usually only a couple of pages long. Like I said, uh, information about upcoming deadlines, uh, tips and tricks about things that you can do, um, how to do things in the, in the application process. Um, they do have a nice application process. Uh, let's see, I have a copy of it here. Um, flowchart, I suppose we call it. A nice colorful flowchart. There we go. 
to do, that you can get on their website. This shows the library's process and the um, service provider's process. So if you're interested in that, that's the application process there. Um, these other two things listed here, E-Rate Central and Funds for Learning, these are both companies that do um, these are like those consultant companies that I mentioned, where you can pay a company to, to submit your ERA application for you. However, they both do have really good free information on their websites. Um, help guides, instructions, um, rewriting of some of the ERA stuff. Um, I actually use both of them myself um, sometimes when I can't even myself understand what you rate where USAC has mentioned or the FCC has said. They've really helped me out. So I do recommend those if you want to, um, if you need more help. Um, about something. And of course me. You can contact me. That's what I'm here for. Um, the 800 number here at the Library Commission, my email address. We do have an E-Rate website where I've got a lot of links to these things that you might need. Um, the spreadsheet for your school lunch numbers from the Department of Nebraska Department of Education, where to get your FCC registration numbers, where to apply to all the forms, uh, timelines of everything. Um, the recording of this, re this session will be posted onto that website as well. So you can have access to that and the PowerPoint that I used here. Um, all of that will be available, is all available on our website. So um, that will officially wrap it up for today. It's um, E-Rate uh, what's new for 2018 webinar. Please do call me, email me if you need any help as you're going through the process. It's not an easy process, I know, but it is a very uh, fruitful process if you do get that discount and that's my job, that's what I'm here for is to get you your E-rate money and I can do whatever, I do whatever I can to help you navigate and get through it successfully. So thank you very much for attending and um, good luck with E-rate. <laughs>